Hello, and welcome back to Dr. Hollowed. I'm John. In today's episode, we bring you three hours of the creepiest and most terrifying experiences ever known. So sit back, relax, and don't forget to like and subscribe. A couple of years ago, I saw two rather large men having an argument in the street in front of my house. After a couple of minutes, they drove off and went their separate ways. I didn't think anything of it until the next day when I get a knock on my door. It turns out that one of my roommates had been sleeping with a married woman and her husband somehow found where we lived and was at our house with a shotgun to kill the guy who banged his wife. The dude had a couple of priors that definitely lent the threat some credibility. The man at the door was his dad, who told me that the argument was him talking his son down. He told me that he showed up as his son was getting out of the car. He asked me if I was the guy in question and I said I wasn't. He said oh, you're the roommate? He was going to kill you too. Turns out my other roommate had done some things with the young lady as well. The kicker is that I was home alone at the time. Basically, I unknowingly watched a man talk down my future murderer from my dining room window. There used to be this show I loved called Forensic Files. Ten years ago I was preparing to fly home from college in Montana for winter break. An episode about a kidnapped girl who was eventually murdered was on. It was particularly captivating for me because her body had actually been found nearby my school. It was an awful story, too, and went into detail about how the sadistic murderer tortured the girl's family for years by calling them and taunting them on the anniversary of her death. The next day I was sitting in the airport reading a magazine or something and I look up. Sitting in front of me, five or six feet away, is the murdered girl's mother. I just remember my jaw dropping and I stared her for what seemed like a minute or two. Finally I got up the courage to speak and asked her if she was who I thought she was. She confirmed, explaining that every year she comes to visit the site of where her daughter's body was found. And every year, per an agreement she had with the network, they would air her daughter's episode on that day in remembrance of her. When I was about 12 to 13 years old, I was waiting for my friends at the entrance to a large park in my city. While I waited a van pulled up and a guy rolled down his window and asked me what are you up to? To which I replied waiting for my friends as I paced back and forth slightly away from the van with each step. He said where are they coming from? And I answered from the metro, and he said hop in, I can give you a lift there. Well at this point I know he's a creeper so I told him no, thanks and began to walk away, while he insisted I accept his lift. I left the park entrance and he pulled into the parking lot, did a U-turn, and drove out of the park along the road I was walking on. Having noticed what he was doing early on, I walked really fast to a hole in the fence of the park and climbed in. From that point he'd have to do a 8 to 10 minute drive to get back to where I was. Met up with my friends a little bit later and told them the story. One night on my cousin's farm, me my two cousins and two family friends were sitting on hay bales as it got dark waiting for the coyotes to come out. Me and the two family friends decided it would be funny for one of us to throw a shoe to make some noise and then ditch my cousin on the hay bale. The four of us ran to the barn while my cousin stayed on the hay bales. We stayed in the barn for a good 30 minutes waiting for her to come find us but she didn't. We went to go check on her but she wasn't there. We found her back inside the house. The creepy part was when we talked to her. She asked us which one of us had been running around banging on the fence. We got really confused because we had ran straight for the barn. So we asked her what she meant. Apparently she had seen a person sneaking around with a black sweatshirt on with the hood up and had taken a stick and hit it against the trough and fence several times. She had thought it was us since we were all wearing black hoodies. We were certain she wasn't lying because she had asked us first and proudly declared it didn't scare her. The next day while all five of us were out fishing my uncle said there were two people walking around by the gravel pit near the hay bales who he thought was two of us. We still don't know who was out there or what they were doing. My SO was in an accident, which demolished her car. After the accident, we stored the car in our driveway with a tarp covering it until the insurance towed it and etc. She was in Canada for a convention, which left me and the dogs alone at home for the weekend. When I got home from work, I thought it was a good idea to call my parents to catch up. The wind was intense that day and blew the tarp off of the passenger side of the car. As I am speaking with my parents, I decide to pull the tarp back over the car. I'm talking with my parents and listening to them describe their day when I hear a faint voice saying, Hey! I have no idea where it is coming from until I look down. There is a man sitting in my car. I have never seen this man before but he looks at me and asks, where's Dan and Isaac? Now, I don't know either of those people and I told him that I did not. I can see he has all of the personal items from the car in his lap. I start telling him that he needs to get out of the car and leave. 
Then I see the pepper spray in his hands, which was left by my SO. I knew at that moment that my day would end with being pepper sprayed. So I tell my parents to call the cops. He steps out of the car asking, where is the ice? I just tell him that he has the wrong place and grab the CD case out of his hands. He reaches for the pepper spray and I back up, quick. He stops and says, I'll be back bro. Just you watch. I watch him walk off and for a brief moment he starts yelling at a tree down the street. The cops came and he was found up the road but the officers could not find my stuff. The experience definitely freaked me out for the rest of the night. When I was about 10, I was asleep in bed and was awoken by some sounds outside my first floor window. It was summertime so my window was open and just the screen was there. Suddenly, I see a flashlight get shined in my room starting on one side and moving towards me. I quietly hopped out of bed and scrambled to right under the window so they wouldn't see me. Thank God it worked and they couldn't see me. And at that moment, my golden retriever came in my bedroom and started growling and barking. They took the light away and I heard multiple male voices talking nervously and then stumbling out of the bushes, running away. I wouldn't sleep for like a week. When I was about 10 or 11 years old, early 1980s, I was watching TV with my dad and older brother. With no warning or apparent reason, my dad lunged for the television to turn it off, but just before he reached it, the power went out in the entire neighborhood, followed by three large booms. When we asked what the hell was going on, he said he didn't want the TV to blow out with the surge. But you jumped before the lights went out. He just shrugged. My brother and I looked at each other like we were in a Twilight Zone episode. We all walked outside after we heard sirens and found the source of the problem around the corner, a car accident where one car crashed through a power transformer, and one person was decapitated through the sunroof. All these years later I still remember the events of that night like it was yesterday. Later, I told one of my dad's friends what had happened, expecting him to tell him I remembered incorrectly, or imagined it. He told me that my dad was known in Vietnam to be the first in his group to know that they were in danger. I worked at a campground over the summer and I agreed to do security watch on the Tuesday after Labor Day. It's completely empty all day long and we spent most of the day cleaning and repairing various items in the campground. It was also a family campground with tons of things to do like zip lining, paintballing, go-karting, and hiking. It was relatively large approximately 50 square acres. Anyways, I'm doing security which mostly consists of driving around in a golf cart, and making sure people aren't doing anything. That night, a motion sensor went off on the upper loop which had been out of use since July for renovations. Usually when a motion sensor goes off, it's a raccoon or a deer, but we have to check anyways. I make my way up to the motion sensor, which was going off constantly on my way up, and logged it on our notebook. When I got up there, there was this fucking lady's voice singing in the middle of the night. I walk around and head towards it. Bad idea, there was this 40-something meth head in a dress walking around singing. She saw me and chased after me. I ran as fast as I could to the golf cart and took off down to the main office. I called the police but they were going to be close to an hour. I stayed locked up in the office until they got there. She paced around the front door and screamed at me the whole time. When they got there, they arrested her and we went up to the same loop where she was to look for more. I swear, looking for more meth heads was more terrifying than being chased by her. She had been living in one of the yurts we had yet to get to for over two months. She looked like a witch. The yurt was destroyed and we ended up burning it down. I'm sure most of this thread will be about spooky slash paranormal experiences. I've had some sleep paralysis experiences that were creepy but by far the creepiest experience I've had was just another human being having a straight up lack of boundaries. I was 18, in college and living with my boyfriend in our first apartment. He had left for an early class and I had the day off so I was sleeping in. I awoke to a man I didn't know sitting on the end of my bed staring at me. When he saw me wake up he said it's time to get up now and just kept looking at me. I was trying to figure out if I was awake or dreaming and if there was anything I could do to avoid getting raped and murdered. He just kept sitting and looking. I figured out I was awake and also remembered that I was sleeping naked so I didn't want to get up unless he made a move. After what felt like a lifetime of silence, but was probably only a minute, he said it again. It's time to get up now, I said okay still too shocked and scared to figure out that I could ask him who he was or tell him to leave or start screaming for help. He got up and walked out of the room and I heard voices in my kitchen. He left my bedroom door open when he left so I still didn't want to get up because of the naked thing. After a few minutes I built up the courage to wrap a blanket around myself, grab some clothes, and dash to the bathroom. As I passed the door I saw him standing in the kitchen doorway and just staring into my room, watching me run for the bathroom. I got dressed and began to slowly make my way towards my cell phone. 
I had to pass him in my kitchen where I could now hear three male voices in order to get to where it was plugged in. As I passed, I saw that two of the men were in plumber's outfits and half of my kitchen was soaking wet. It turns out my upstairs neighbors had burst a pipe and these men were here to fix it and needed to access the problem pipe through my ceiling. The man sitting on my bed was with the realty company and had let them in. He says they knocked but I never heard it and no one had called either myself or my boyfriend so say they were coming over. I have no idea why he thought that was an appropriate way to wake me up or why he didn't feel the need to explain who he was or what was going on. Needless to say, we broke our lease and found somewhere else to live after that. A couple years ago I went on my first hunting trip. My GF's dad and I arrived around midnight and it was pitch black out there in the country. While he was inside setting up the cabin, I was outside unpacking the truck by myself. All of a sudden, I hear a man's voice from the abandoned barn, about 50 feet from me, saying, come over here. PSST come over here. I stopped and looked over there, I was pretty much frozen in disbelief. Then he continued, hey, I said come over here. Come on. Then it stopped. I dropped my stuff, walked calmly into the cabin and asked my GF's dad how close the nearest house is, and I was told it was about half a mile down the road. After I told him what just happened, he didn't seem to believe me but took his gun out and he kinda just called over to the area, but there was no response. Kinda freaked me out. On a side note, later that night while I was trying to sleep, I heard a loud crash come from the living room and heard him yell what the fuck. So of course I assumed the worse, that the creepy man broke in and was attacking him. I ran out of my room ready for a fight, but found him sitting on a broken heap of wood. Apparently he sat in an old wooden chair and was too heavy, so it broke on him ha ha. A few years ago my best friend and I went to Adams Morgan, a strip of bars, clubs, etc., in DC. It was a Saturday night so the whole area was packed with people and we ended up having to park several blocks away in some back alley. As we're walking down the alley I turn around and notice a man with a backpack several yards behind us. I don't think much of it and we keep walking. A few seconds later I look behind us again and now he's a lot closer, so I start speed walking. When I look back again this man is running at full speed toward us. So I grab my BFF's hand and bolt. We start running full speed down this alley with this guy right behind us and end up running into busy DC traffic, nearly getting hit by multiple cars. It was like a scene out of a movie. We somehow made it across the busy six-lane street unscathed and watched the man across the street menacingly stare us down before running away, back up the alley. To this day, we still don't know what that was about. When I was 15, I went into town for my first day doing some charity work. I was early, so sat on a bench in town center for a bit. Someone approached me, introduced himself, said he's just moved here. I briefly introduced myself and we talked a bit about local stuff. He mentioned he was 26, which weirded me out a bit. He was on his phone and suddenly I heard the shutter sound as it faced me. I freaked out and demanded to know why he was taking a photo. He denied it and claimed to be taking photo of the scenery, in a market town with no scenery. Annoyed and creeped out, I just left with no explanation, and went to the charity shop where I spent 6 hours working. So, 6 hours later, I left the shop and started heading home. Suddenly I heard my name being shouted from behind me. It was the creep again. I said to him to leave me alone, but he wouldn't listen and said he won't let me walk home alone. I was yelling at him, telling him to go away, and I started walking quicker and he kept up. In the end, I just ran for my life and I made it home safely and never saw him again. This happened to me about a month ago in rural Michigan. I was out in a rural area on a big, 5,000 acre, patch of state land doing some rabbit hunting by myself. I had been walking for 2 to 3 hours and hadn't seen a damn thing so I decided to turn back and start making my way back to where I'd parked my car. When I got back to the main trail, I basically had to walk about a mile east then take a left and head another 2-ish miles north to get to my car. As I'm walking east I start to get this really, really uneasy feeling. Everything is a bit quieter than usual, quiet even for a day with a decent amount of snow on the ground. The eastbound trail before the turn is a lot of small fields off to the side and hills up until a flat final stretch. As I get up the one of the last hills I look to my left at a field for a second in case I saw any rabbits or coyotes. By the time I turned my head back straight there was a guy straight in front of me about 100 yards walking away from me. Something about him didn't settle right with me. He had no hiking, hunting, or camping gear, just a long sleeve shirt and dirty jeans with a beanie hat on. He was walking really strange, not really picking his feet up, just sort of dragging them along kicking up snow like how a kid would if he was bored, but this was a large grown man. On top of all of this, this was later in the day, almost sundown, 
and there were no other cars in the area I'd parked when I got there, which was the only reasonable way into the trail, so no way this guy had driven there suddenly to take a quick hike. I keep walking a little slower and all of a sudden the guy stops, turns his head halfway and I can tell he's looking at me. He turns his head back and just bolts running. This startled the shit out of me and I stopped walking. Now I know there's something seriously wrong with this guy so I stopped and swapped out the birdshot and my shotgun to a few buckshot shells I always carried in my backpack just in case. I kept walking forward cautiously, and once I got to the turn in the trail I looked down the trail and the guy was nowhere to be seen. This final stretch of trail goes about 2 miles and is completely flat. There is absolutely no way he could have made it all the way down the trail by the time I got to that spot, even if he was Usain Bolt. And I could see in the snow that he was wearing heavy boots. It's a nice trail but the sides are covered with thick brush and deep forest. So basically now I knew that this guy was hiding off to the side in the brush somewhere. That had to have been the absolute longest, most unsettling walk I have made in my entire life. I tried to stay with his boot trail in the snow to try and get an idea of where he was but it was lost in old prints from whatever group had hunted the trail that morning. I racked a shell in the shotgun as loud as I possibly could in hopes that he'd hear it, but that didn't really comfort me that much when I was walking near extra heavy thickets or on the side of tall berms where he could have been. Plus with the snow it's hard to hear anything moving around. Even once I got back to my car I was really in the middle of nowhere surrounded by more forests so I kept the gun loaded with me as I got into the car so I didn't have to unload it in my trunk and be exposed before I got in the car and locked it. That whole walk I just kept repeating the old biblical passage as I walk through the valley in the shadow of death I shall fear no evil in my head pretty uncontrollably. Something just felt very, very wrong and I'm never going hunting there again alone. Three years ago, I admitted myself into the mental wing of the hospital and was put on 48 hours suicide watch. It was about 3 am when I finally finished giving them all of my belongings and had a temporary cot to sleep on while waiting for a room to open up. Mind you, these cots are only separated by a sheet, and there are several unpredictable people around me who were also being admitted. One of these people was a guy my age, about half a foot taller than me, and had this wild look to him. He reminded me a lot of Gary Busey, which scared the shit out of me. Apparently he'd taken a ton of mushrooms, dropped acid, and went on an Everclear drinking binge before the cops were called and brought him in. About an hour after falling asleep from a Valium the nurse gave me, I start waking up out of this semi-lucid, groggy, blurred state, to see the dim light above me eclipsed by a figure. I assumed it was a doctor or nurse, but as my vision became clearer, my heart began to pound. The wildly pulled hair, wide open manic eyes, and full-toothed smile was inches above my face. I felt as if I were paralyzed, hoping I could sink deeper into the cot while he raised his hand, crooked and wretched like a claw closer to me. Within seconds, two utterly massive security guards sprinted over, one running so fast that he inadvertently tackled the guy to the floor from having too much momentum to stop himself. That was by far the most terrifying experience I'd ever had. The rest of my time there however, something else disturbing happened. Our actual rooms had double doors with small glass panes on each one. At night, the doors would close, and security would patrol the hallway. For those two nights, I would hear the routine footsteps of the guard as he walked past in his heavy boots. But I also heard, and saw something entirely different. I began to notice light, rapid, tiptoeing in between each round the guard made in my section of the wing square layout. The guard's boots would pass. But a minute later I would hear. Shuffle, light steps, shuffle, faster and faster on. Stop. I still wish I didn't look. I wish I would have kept my head buried under the covers in that room. I slowly turned my head, and raised the sheet until I could just barely see out of my one eye. As I looked at the door, I noticed nothing but the shine of two eyes staring at me. It was so dark I couldn't see the face behind them, just eyes. After a minute, horrified, they would swiftly go away, giggling and laughing under their breath until I heard the click of their door closing down the hall. Yeah, that creeped me the fuck out alright. That was more than enough motivation to seek out a therapist, and thankfully, I've been depression slash anxiety free ever since. I got off a shift at the restaurant I used to serve at, and I was having a drink at the bar and waiting to pick up some food to bring home. A random guy came up and started talking to me and hitting on me. I was super not interested and politely declined. I proceeded to bike back to my apartment. A couple weeks later, I was at the same restaurant with some friends. I saw the same guy, and he told me that the first time he met me, he and his friend followed me home when I was biking. I tried leaving the bar as quickly as I could, and I biked home. A co-worker contacted me saying that he left the bar right after I did and drove away in the direction I headed. The next time I saw the co-worker who messaged me, 
he said he was thankful to see me alive. When I was in middle school, me and a buddy were digging a fox hole in his backyard. The sun was going down and the hole was getting pretty deep. Then I came across this weird clump of dirt with what seemed like a black plastic bag in the mix. I took the dirt clump, which was odd because of the way it held together so well, and starting breaking it apart as best I could. This dirt was different than the other dirt somehow. While breaking it up I found a gold coin in it. Cool, I thought, turning it over in my hands. I was wiping the dirt off and noticed there were words on the coin. Straining to read them, I could only make out the big word in the center, shadow. I stared at it for a few seconds, and suddenly it clicked. I had been crumbling apart a decomposed dog corpse, probably from the previous homeowners. I leapt right out of that foxhole and washed my hands for a solid five minutes. More gross than creepy, I suppose, but at the time it really freaked me out. I visited Mount Vernon on a whim and I knew where everything was. I realized I had dreamed about this place for years, and that only when I was there did I realize all those dreams were connected. I pointed out to the tour guide, correctly, that there used to be different furniture there or the stone colors were off. I knew that a certain basement cellar was for storage and hurricane coverage. I identified his family members, brothers, by name and paintings. Never believed in past lives before but that was pretty odd. Edit, wow, this got more traction than I thought. To answer questions, in all the dreams I'd had of the place, I was a servant, not a Washington, lots of grueling work in the kitchen and the garden. Confirmed with parents I'd never been there before. Willing to explain it away with deja vu, but do a lot of people fantasize about being an indentured servant? When I was in university I moved into an apartment by myself and needed my internet and TV hooked up. The guy came over to hook everything up and was a little chatty, but generally seemed nice. I hate having strangers in my place so I wasn't very chatty back and he didn't stick around. The next day, I was just getting out of the shower and my apartment buzzer kept ringing. When I answered it a guy was like hi, I'm here from Shaw. You just had TV and internet installed yesterday and I'm here to just make sure it's all working correctly. I was just wearing a towel and was really weirded out because it was working fine and nobody had told me there was a follow-up appointment. So I lied and said sorry I have a bunch of people over right now. It's not a good time. Then I called Shaw and asked if they sent someone over and they said that they did not. It really freaked me out. Paramedic here. We were called at 2 a.m. to a little town in the hills away from our area. Someone had called with chest pain and needed an ambulance. It took us a while to get up there because the road was unsealed and weaved around the mountainside. We drove into the town and there were no lights on at all except for a phone box lit up on the street. The address was actually a little ways out of the other side of town, about 3 kilometers or so, but when we got to the street we found no street numbers. It was very hard to see where we were going but we soon found a shack hidden behind some trees where we think the address was so we pulled up and knocked on the door. No answer, so I knocked again. After about a minute a woman stepped in from the edge of the door all dressed in white, not saying a word, and standing with her nose pressed against the screen and wide-eyed. I asked if she had called for an ambulance, and she just shook her head. I asked if anyone else had, and I could see another figure in white standing further back in the house. No lights were turned on, and no one said a word, so we got back into the ambulance and kept searching. We drove to the end of the road which ended in a property with a huge house that had about 30 windows and a yard full of old cars. No lights were on in the house. We tried to call and radio our communications center but we were unable to get to them in any way due to the location. We drove back into the town, and decided to use the phone booth to call communications about the job. We found a few coins, and feeling a little creeped out, we got a hold of them. They told us they had no further information for us, and to have another look around. As directed, we drove back down to the road and had another look. We couldn't find anything matching the house description we were given, and even had trouble finding driveways. Finally we got all the way to the end of the street, and looked up into the huge house at the end of the road. This time, a single light was on in the front room and standing looking out away from us into darkness was a figure all dressed in black with a huge pointed hood. We waited, terrified, to see if this was the call, and he didn't move despite us doing everything to get his attention. After what seemed like forever, my partner started to scream, and we drove as fast as we could away from the house, up the road, through town, and back down the curling road till we got to the highway. Both of us were shaken by the experience and didn't know what to make of it. Once we arrived back into mobile phone range, we called the communications center to explain that we couldn't find the patient despite further searches. The lady on the other end of the phone explained that they were unable to reach the caller again despite trying, and ended up tracing the call to the phone booth we had called them from in town. I hung up the phone and we both sat silently for the ride home, before my partner asked me if I believed in the devil. I told her I don't know. 
I got one, hope it isn't too late. Anyways, so about three years ago I was taking a year off from college and was back in my tiny hometown in the Midwest. I had a lot of friends in the area and we used to love to go out in groves, abandoned buildings, and anywhere else to shoot coons, skunks, possums, and the occasional coyote. Yes, it was a pretty redneck pastime but we also go paid for it. One night, I think it was about late March or early April, like spring was right around the corner but there was still snow on the ground. About six of us went to an old abandoned house a decent way from town, and as we drove up to it, it looked like your average abandoned house, tall grass all over the yard, including the driveway, broken windows, etc etc. As we all got out of the truck, we noticed there was a female mannequin head tied by her hair on a window sill on the second story. We ignored it and started moving to the front door, which we quickly discovered was locked. Now, this is where I usually like to call it and find somewhere else to go, but one of my friends just crawled through a broken window and let us in. Right off the bat, something was wrong. Although there was no furniture or anything else that would show a living person was occupying the house, there was also no dust. I pointed that out, and was just told to stop being a bitch by my friends. We walked through the main floor and didn't find anything, and then we checked out the basement. The basement was full of mason jars. Like, easily 1000 of them, probably more. I said something was definitely up, and we needed to GTFO, but once again, my friends told me to man up. They smashed a few of them before I convinced them to go upstairs and check that out. We climbed up back to the main floor, and then to the second story. When we got up to the top level, I split off from the rest of the group, pulled out a knife, and cut the mannequin head down. I was looking at it in my hand when my friends called out to me and told me to check out what they found. I ran to them and found about three sleeping bags, some old bikes, lots of shoes, and lots of Mountain Dew bottles. Some of these bottles were frozen, some were not. This is where we all decided it was time to get out of this house. Once out of the house, we waited up out pickup while we decided where to go next. But, we figured no one was at the house at the time so we would do a quick sweep of the barn and corn crib and then leave. We went to a shed quick and shined a light in it, didn't see anything, and headed for the corn crib. I'm not sure why, but I was walking alone to the crib, with one friend following me by about 15 feet and the six others stayed at the shed for some reason. I was getting close to the crib, but I had my eyes on my gun, I was just checking it over to make sure everything was right, when my friend shouted, holy shit, I just saw something move through the window on the second story. He then ran up to me, and I took out a flashlight and shined it at the window, I didn't see anything but a glimmer of light caught my eye on the main story. I shined my light into the main floor of the crib and there was blood. Everywhere. Just typing this I'm getting goosebumps all over. There was blood coming down the wall from the second story, all over the wall, and starting to drip onto the floor, it wasn't even starting to coagulate. We got the fuck out of there ASAP, as my friends saw it from the shed they were still at. Later that year, in June or so, I told that story to a girl I liked, and she didn't believe me. We ended up getting into my truck, driving to the house in the middle of the day, and I put my high beams on the crib without ever getting out of the truck, the dried blood was there, but it didn't look like any more ever came from the second story. The summer after, the barn next to the corn crib burned down. The sheriff department said a moonshine installment went wrong and then people operating it fled the area. I still have no idea why there was so much blood, it wasn't mentioned in the report at all. I was 17 and working at my first job stocking items at a grocery store, very mundane, but it allowed for some freedom. I'd had a few run-ins with random odd people, but nothing I couldn't handle. About two months in I'm shelving on the lowest level in the canned food aisle and a very tall man comes to hover over me, so close his knees are touching my back. I told myself it was a coincidence and say excuse me. And try to slide sideways out of his way, but he steps around me, trapping me. I tried a few more times to the same result when he crouches down and asks if I'd ever had a full body massage. My heart was racing and I was panicked but like an idiot I froze up, while the guy proceeds to roughly rub my shoulders. At that moment a coworker popped her head around the corner to see how I was getting along and surprised him, he waved a hand and goes high like it was normal. I booked it to the back and told my manager who in turn told security who saw him out. I wish it had ended there, but me being me which obviously means stupid, and I was going through a major grown up slash independent streak, had myself a good cry and then refused all offers to go home for the day, I also wanted to talk to the police when they got there. A little over an hour later, still no police and I hear a bunch of ruckus and shouting. Then someone yelled my name, I went to investigate. It was a co-worker trying to tell me to get to the back, but he'd come back with a baseball bat, and a Rottweiler looking for me. The pair of them quickly march over to me all the while the dog is snarling and he's saying how the dog likes me, 
he knew it would, I must be good with animals, and he would finish that massage back at his place. I got pinned but my manager, one of the best women I've ever met somehow gets herself between me and the dog this guy's keeps, not asking, not telling, but commanding me to pet. She stayed there holding onto me behind her back until finally the police get there. After a brief but tense standoff he's arrested the dog taken to the pound. I sensibly went home. Several months later, long enough for me to all but have forgotten everything my manager calls me into her office. She says she wanted to be there when I found out and handed me a newspaper, it took me way too long to register what was so important, the man had been arrested for murder and kidnapping. We both started crying, and I went home for the day, I couldn't handle it, and wound up leaving shortly after. I think the creepiest slash scariest part was how calm he was during the whole thing, even after the officers got there and his dog started losing its shit he was just so very, very calm, and normal looking, like this was a normal thing. I was in Portland Oregon about 6 months ago for training at work. A bunch of co-workers and I went out drinking the last night we were there. They ended up going home before me and I found myself trying to find my way home around 3.30 am with a dead phone. There is a large homeless population in Portland, many of which I pass sleeping on the sidewalk under shop entrances. At one point, I come across a bus stop, and what appears to be a little old woman bent over looking for something in her purse. I ask her if she knows which direction my hotel is in and she whirls around and I notice her teeth are rotting and they look as if they were sharpened at the end, most likely from the decay. She had leathery tan skin, frizzy white hair, and these terrifying light blue eyes that were opened as wide as they would go. She lets out a scream at the top of her lungs, not like a scared scream, but like a terrifying witch scream, and says don't go down that road back there, there's a man with a knife and he's not a good person. Don't go down there, don't go he is bad. She just stands there wide-eyed, repeating that over and over yelling at my face. I listened for about 5 seconds before I took off the other direction about to shit my pants. I looked back about a block away and she was still there yelling to me. Most terrifying encounter I've ever experienced. My friend and I experienced missing time so to speak, while on a canoe trip. About 10 years ago my friend and I went on a trip to Ketiko Provincial Park in Ontario. Ketiko is a wilderness park, so there's no car camping or any sort of facilities like that. You get your permit, and put in at your entry point. The amount of permits given out is limited to preserve the park, so it's unlikely that you will run into any other people during your trip, maybe a ranger. We put in at Beaver House, and our route took us south into the Boundary Waters, a wilderness park in Minnesota. We chose our route poorly and ended up having to take a grueling 8 kilometers portage. We weren't properly packed or light enough to make this portage in one go, which was a big mistake. We also overestimated ourselves and started it too late in the afternoon. I've done many portages before but this was something else, it had it all. Canadian shield gnarled roots rocks and moss, flooded marshland, huge smooth granite saddles, dense humus soil that sucked your boots in, the works. I don't know how long it took exactly, but I'd say at least an hour and a half, each way. It didn't help that our canoe was fairly heavy, we tried to save a few bucks by not renting a Kevlar one and used my friend's rubberized canoe that's meant for running rapids. Thankfully it was though, because I must have dropped it at least 50 times, but you can just kick the dents out. Anyway, we're on the way back to get the rest of our stuff and make the second trip, practically on the verge of tears from exhaustion. And it's starting to get dark. Not good, we have flashlights, but setting up in the dark sucks, don't even mention trying to find a campsite. We load up the food, and get moving. Ten minutes later we round a bend and I see some packs and a green canoe. I think shit, we must have taken a wrong turn and ended up at someone's campsite but there were no branching trails, and no campsites nearby. I take a closer look and realize it's our stuff. But how? We had passed none of the landmarks we had before, like the granite saddles. We were certainly exhausted, but I find it hard to believe that I could zone out for that many kilometers, and what about my friend? He also acknowledged that we finished the portage in an impossibly short time. I looked at the maps, thinking maybe we had accidentally taken some alternate trail or loop back before, but there was nothing just 8 kilometers of land between the two lakes. Now that I've typed this out it feels anticlimactic. But there's just simply no explanation for traveling 8 kilometers in 10 minutes. I'm looking at my old maps now to try and find where this occurred exactly. Last year I was on an outward bound trip in the Rockies on a 14 day expedition. In case you guys aren't hip to the outward bound course, there is a solo about 3 slash 4 THS the way through the trip, which is pretty much you're in your own area out of eyeshot and hearing range of other group members for a set amount of time, this expedition had a two-day one, so on day 11 or so we stop, to do ours. 
Mind you this is a 9 day hike from the closest base camp, and we went about a mile off the rugged trail we were taking to set up. I woke up on the second day of the solo and looked out of my tarp and saw a guy about 20 feet away in a solid cherry red hoodie with the hood draw strings fully pulled, so his face was entirely covered, I figured this was one of the instructors, because they go around sometime on the second day to check on us, so I waved at him and smiled. He then took off uphill and I lost sight in the trees. Come the next day when we are all back and talking about it, I asked which of the instructors had the red hoodie. Turns out neither of them did. There was a man 10,000 feet up a mountain in the middle of the woods who walked by me sleeping in a tent. It had potential to go pretty awry. I worked for a handful of years in a haunted building, buildings to be more exact, as there were two Victorian houses and a carriage house on the property of the museum where I worked as visitor services manager in my 20s. Here's a few creepy highlights and increasing levels of creepiness. Fair warning, this is long. 1. My office was located in the brick carriage house built in 1872. I was a full-time employee so I was often there alone when the building and museum was closed to the public. There were always footsteps and other old houses settling noises, so easily disregarded on a sunny day in a building bustling with tourists. But when you're the only one there, working away at a computer, with your back facing the entire lower level, and you constantly hear steps walking slowly up to your chair. Not so fun. Worse, on one quiet Monday evening I was closing up and the security guard was in the building with me. I ran upstairs to use the facilities, and while washing my hands I distinctly heard a man's voice call my name twice from just outside the door. I thought something must be wrong the guard had come to get me. I whipped open the door to find the landing empty. The security guard was downstairs, and had no idea what I was talking about when I asked him if he'd called my name. We then had to search the entire building just in case someone had broken in, but of course the building was empty. 2. One evening around 9 pm I was in one of the other two buildings on site, a massive Victorian Gothic mansion. Most of the staff had stayed late for some community event or other. I had gone up to the second floor to grab some paperwork. The back left corner of the second floor had once been servants' quarters but was now staff offices. The small 7 feet by 7 feet rooms that had been deemed appropriate as maids' quarters wholly lent themselves to cramped and crowded individual offices for the grants manager and community relations lady. As I was walking by the teensy dark hallway that led to the teensy dark offices I heard a breathy exchange between two female voices and then laughter. Though I couldn't hear what had been said, the laughter that followed was clear as a bell. I thought my co-workers must be up to something, or trying to play a joke, so I started down the hallway towards the closed door, from behind which I could still hear laughter. As I reached for the knob all the hair stood up on my arm as I realized with absolute certainty that I was the only person upstairs. I had seen all my co-workers downstairs right before I'd come up the stairs. The laughter stopped abruptly and I scurried away. 3. We were featured on the TV show Ghost Hunters and to play off the possible increase in visitation, put together an after-hours ghost tour. Being a social justice museum, we couldn't really make it too creepy, and it unfortunately ended up heavy-handed and educational. Regardless, the main house, which belonged to a 19th-century author in her later years, had seen its fair share of tragedy and strangeness, and even towing a strict mission-related content line, we were able to make the tour somewhat engaging. Also the house is something out of nightmares, dark woodwork, velvet everywhere, fully decorated just as it had been when the famous owner had lived, and died, there some 120 years ago. So anyway we're taking a group through on a normal night and we're using a digital voice recorder, I know, I know, silly. In one of the upstairs bedrooms a young man, Thomas Ryder, had visited in the 1870s had died suddenly under suspicious circumstances. People had often reported seeing a man in dark clothes looming in the shadows on the second floor during daytime tours. So in that room we would always ask Thomas Ryder, are you here with us tonight? Okay, again, I know Campy. Myself and the other tour guide do our whole rigmarole, the guests are properly creeped out, we close up the house and grounds and head home for the night. I live about 45 minutes away from the museum. I was driving past this little pond in my little town, where it's very very dark, and suddenly I hear my own voice loud in my car. Thomas Ryder are you here with us tonight? I almost crashed into the pond, it was a matter of a foot or so. When I finally managed to shakily put my truck in park I sat there for several seconds, listening hard to the silence in the cab. I looked behind me, behind the seats. I was alone in the car. And then I realized I had accidentally brought the digital voice recorder home with me. Simple explanation though strange that it had skipped five tracks forward, to the middle of a track, played the one sentence, and then promptly shut itself off again. Part 2, it had been an exceptionally boring day, as most were, working at an ill-attended museum. All told, 
I think we'd sent a total of one tour with one visitor and their disinterested college student tour guide through the house. I'd spent most of the day staring longingly at googled pictures of Robert Pattinson on the computer behind the front desk. As I said, this was a while ago, my tastes have improved. It was before the clock spring forward for the season so it was nearing dark before closing and the deep cloud cover and persistent drizzle didn't improve the ambient lighting. Seated at the front desk in the poorly stocked gift shop, I sent my two remaining tour guides in to close the house for the night, which involved switching off lights, switching others on, shutting some doors, and opening yet others, apparently all to ensure the house burned in a particular manner where that a blaze took it in the night. Or to set up some specifically encouraged path for robbers who managed to ninja sneak past the security system to steal tired velvet upholstered settees and ugly faded lithographs. So the two tour guides were in the house and I was stationed at the front desk, on the main floor of the 1872 carriage house. Directly above me was a lofty attic space used as merchandise and junk storage of the type only museums seem to accumulate, because everyone should save the posters from the 1994 mother-daughter tea fundraiser, just in case. Above me and to the right was the guide break room complete with crappy folding table and chairs, microwave and multiple boxes and crates of books, educational material, and related. Downstairs in the gift shop, on my desk was an old handset landline phone that could dial out but could also, with the press of an aptly labeled guide room button reach the room above on speakerphone, so that I might call up and announce a pending tour, or yell at them, or sing, though I don't think I ever did sing to the guides up there. I was just finishing up considering what color Robert Pattinson's eyes might be in candlelight when I started to hear the most disconcerting racket coming from the guide break room. It sounded very much like a person of considerable girth lifting heavy objects carrying them to the other side of the room, and then unceremoniously dumping them out, stomping the entire time. This continued for perhaps 30 seconds and I recall the thought that drifted up through my confusion and irritation was that sounds urgent as if the person was doing whatever it was they were doing as fast as possible. Anyway I was pissed, and no one should have been up there, I called up, on speaker phone, and said something like what the hell are you doing? And no one answered so I went with the classic fallback of hello? Hell ooh? Hello? Hello? And then my voice died in my throat as I listened. I could hear him slash her slash it moving clearly through the speaker phone, picking things up, shoving things, dropping things, then I heard it come up to the desk where the phone sat. I could hear it breathing, breathing hard and moving things on the desk, papers, maybe even the phone base. It was at that moment that I realized that not only had I seen both my tour guides leave to close the adjacent house, confirming that I was indeed alone in the building, but that I could see all unlocked doors from my seat, and no one had come in since their departure. I immediately radioed our aged by well-meaning security guard who happened to be standing just outside the front door of the carriage house in the misty yuckness of the evening, God knows why he wasn't inside where it was much warmer. He went straight up the stairs upon my call. I watched him march up the first set of stairs and then listened as he turned at the landing and walked up the last handful tentatively. I held my breath waiting for him to open the door and then heard no more sounds. Rod? What's up there? Rod WHO's up there? But there was no one. He came back down the stairs looking at me a bit owlishly as I had insisted there was someone up there. The room had been empty and nothing had been touched, save a pile of freshly crumpled paper in the center of the table. At this point my guides, having heard the ruckus on the radio, returned from closing the house. They swore up and down that when they'd left nothing had been amiss, that they had not crumpled the paper. There had been a stack of neat new paper on the center of the table when they'd gone to close up. I won't lie. I was shaken by it. I grew up in old houses and have worked in the historical field my entire adult life, so I've encountered a few odd and inexplicable things over the years. But this was much scarier. After we'd finished closing up the visitor center for the day, I knew I would be returning to an empty house and the thought was too much to bear. I instead sat in the parking lot of the local grocery store until my husband finished work. I have no idea what I heard up in that room, who walked up to the phone and was so frantically moving unseen objects, but I know with absolute certainty that it was not good and that is was angry. The oral history that had passed down from guide to guide for generations of museum employees spoke of a young man, a stable hand, who had hanged himself in the building at the end of 19th century. But most museums have a story like that, and it's likely not true. Whatever this was, I sincerely hope I don't meet it again. About 15 or so years ago, when I was 16, I went to visit my aunt and uncle during my summer vacations, they used to live with my family when I was growing up, but had moved to a small hill station when I was 12. Their house, along with others in the community, was at the foothills of the mountain, while the downtown was about 10 km away, reachable from their house by crossing a bridge over a river. Downtown is where all the shops were, including my uncle's small chemist shop that he operated with help of a young guy named Kieran, 
about 23 years old or so. I used to hang out with him whenever I was at the shop, pretty talkative and friendly guy and lived close to my uncle's house. One afternoon, my aunt asked me to go to the downtown to grab a few things from the local shops there, she asked me to take the spare scooter that was at their house. Thrilled with the idea of driving, I took the scooter, crossed the bridge, got into downtown, went to a couple of shops and got the stuff. On the way back, I see Kieran walking towards the direction of the bridge, it would have been about 5 pm or so at that time, and I assumed that he had left early to go home that day, my uncle would shut his shop by 7.30 pm. I stop the scooter next to him, say hi and make small talk, except that he barely talks, just very basic yes, no answers. After 10 minutes or so, I eventually ask him if he is heading home, and he says yes, I offer to give him a ride to his place and he accepts, sits behind me on the scooter and off we go. It's about 5.30 pm by now, and light had faded fast, the street lamps were on by the time I reached the bridge. Around the middle of the bridge, I start feeling extreme cold, teeth shattering cold, but by the time I get to the other end, I am all okay. So, I look back asking Kieran if he felt that cold as well, except, well, except he is not there. I stop the scooter right away and look back, he simply is not there, vanished in the thin air. I know he couldn't have gotten off the scooter when we were crossing the bridge, just not physically possible to get off the scooter, while it is being driven, sitting at the back seat. My mind could not comprehend what had happened, and in a daze, I drove the scooter back home but didn't tell my aunt about the incident. I wasn't sure what had happened. Later that evening, after my uncle came back home, I asked him about Kieran. Found out no one had seen Kieran for two days, he hadn't come to the shop or gone back to his home. It's been 15 years, and Kieran has not been found. I do not know who I met that evening, who sat behind me on the scooter, who drove with me halfway through to the bridge to simply disappear. So I live and work in a town on Cape Cod that's known for its Native American heritage. I've never believed in spirits or paranormal stuff before this but what happened that day was observed by our entire crew, four people total that day. We were clearing a fire access path to get to the river in case of an emergency this particular week. Everything was going normal, it was early morning and we were nearing the end and we had to clear about a 100 feet diameter area so a fire truck could turn around. Cutting trees, and chipping them into a truck. So a short time before break I look over near the river and just before the river about 150 feet away I see a woman and a child maybe 4 to 5 years of age. What was interesting was they were dressed in deer skin clothing. They were clear as day, clearly native. So I turn to my supervisor and tell him to look over there, and as I turn they're gone. So I thought maybe I'm just seeing things, continue working. Leading up to break I get this intense level of sadness start building. I felt heavy, depressed, almost like I could cry it was that intense. We stop for break and I begin to explain what I saw and just as this happens across the river near the top of the trees is an intense ball of light. This is maybe 300 feet away this ball is huge, like a mini sun. Yellow in the middle to a blue around the edges. We all see this light, and it starts to move along the trees from our left to the right and it disappears off into the distance. A minute or two later we hear a loud drum beating from that direction, three times. It felt like we shouldn't be there and as we're walking away I feel this rush of heat like Teresa fire on my back as we leave. About a month ago, I was walking to the, the local pub. It was probably around 11 pm. I stop across the street to wait for the oncoming traffic to pass. I look across the street and there's a guy standing there looking in another direction. He suddenly looks directly at me. As I cross the street he makes a beeline straight towards me. He walks directly in my path, gets in my face, and starts saying I want you to say something, I dare you to say something. I immediately walk around him without saying anything and power walk towards the door. He follows me so close I could feel his breath on my neck, all the way to the entrance. I finally get through the door and have the courage to turn around. He's nowhere in sight. I look out the window of the bar and I don't see him anywhere. There were people standing outside smoking and plenty of people near the door of the bar. No one ever reacted or even said anything about it. This happened years ago when I was living with one of my exes. We'd gone to bed late, having drunk too much wine while binge watching some BBC show on Netflix. I must have heard something because I went from sound asleep to instantly awake, suddenly aware of a strange voice seemingly coming from inside our bedroom. My mind instantly jumped to someone broke in and I'm about to be murdered. So I'm laying there trying to decide if I should go for the light or grab a decorative sword off the wall when I realize that the voice is coming from my ex laying beside me. But it's not her voice and the words are just gibberish. The voice itself is deeper and more raspy than hers, almost like a guy's, and whatever she was saying sounded like it was broken up like an actual language but the words were meaningless. 
I was pretty freaked out and I think I screamed out her name like a little girl. She was a little confused at first but then adamantly insisted that she has just been awake and talking to me a moment before, so I'm guessing she was dreaming? I wish to god I'd recorded it, it was something straight out of a horror movie. She didn't have a habit of talking in her sleep, or any sleep disorders, and it never happened again the entire time we were together. One time I was sitting around with my mom and some friends sharing stories of the various paranormal experiences that have happened to us. It was actually a veiled attempt to get my mom to share her haunting story but it went horribly wrong. My friend asks me if he could tell the orange fireball story or if I wanted to. This is news to me as I don't recall ever seeing an orange fireball, but I let him tell it thinking maybe it's an amusing tale, or something that happened to someone else. My friend says that me and him had put on our airsoft kit and walked down to the woods to go patrol around midnight. Something we used to do all the time. While we were out there we saw an orange light moving amongst the trees. Seeing as we were trespassing and fearing it might be the authorities we decide to leave. As my friend is telling me this, memories start coming back to me. I begin to remember stuff that he hasn't said yet, like the chase. I also begin to experience an intense feeling of fear and dread as he continues the story. We left the woods but the orange light began snaking its way towards us, worse, several more appeared and seemed to join it in stalking us. It has the appearance of a miniature sun, an orange fireball about the size of a lazy boy chair. By this point we are terrified and decide to risk a shortcut home that would take us across a church and a baseball diamond, in full view of the road, someone might see us, mistake our airsoft guns for actual guns and call the cops, since we were out past curfew we would be double screwed. We exited the woods and crossed the road, a vehicle passed on the road shortly after we crossed. It was like someone flipped a light switch, the orange fireballs go dark. Thinking our ordeal is over we begin to almost relax. Our hearts were still pounding and we were still hyper alert but we were exhausted. We walked across the church property and entered the baseball diamond. Another orange sphere descends in an almost lazy manner from the sky above the houses to our left and begins heading towards us, it's between us and home. This one is different, like a dull dark orange, it doesn't light up the whole area but it's bigger, almost as big as a dumpster. We are too tired to run and there is nowhere to hide. Back in reality, I am filled with such a feeling of impending doom that I ask my friend to stop telling the story. I realize the whole room is looking at us, my friend has a weird glazed look on his face and we both appear to have teared up. Our group decided to stop telling stories for the day and do something else. I don't know if this really happened or if was just caught up in my friend's story. My memories of the event have a layer of surrealishness to them and any time I think of it, I am consumed by an overwhelming sense of doom. I never got around to asking my friend if he made it up or if it really happened and he took his own life a few years later, so there is no closure for me. I have had a reoccurring dream in the past about being out on the baseball diamond and being cornered by the fireball. In my dream it sounds like an angry beehive and I shoot it with my airsoft gun. Sometimes I worry that something horrible happened to me, but I think it's best not to try and remember. This might not be creepy in the traditional sense, but it stayed with me. At my grandmother's funeral, we had a service in the funeral parlor chapel, then we did the burial at the cemetery, then we went back to the funeral parlor for the wake. After a while, everyone was leaving and close family was headed back to my parents' house. The funeral director was standing by the door as everyone was heading out. I was the last one to leave, and just as I'm going out the door, he looks at me and says, see you soon. My grandfather died less than four months later, incidentally. And we had the funeral at the same place. But by that point, a new funeral director had taken over. I still wonder about that guy. If he's out there somewhere, waiting for me. I come from a rather superstitious family. My grandaunt was thought to be sensitive to spirits and whatnot, and would often get possessed. Today, I'm quite sure she simply had some mental issues. Anyway, one day she was in the kitchen chopping vegetables. I must have been about 10 at the time. I went in to rinse a glass for some orange juice. She would have standing next to me, maybe a couple of feet away. I was, naturally, a little afraid of her, so I didn't start any conversation or even look at her while I was washing my glass. All I could hear was the chop 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 of her knife. And then suddenly the sound stopped. I assumed she was simply done with the veggies, but I had this horrible feeling that something else was going on. I turned to look at her and. She was just glaring at me with wide open eyes and this extreme expression of hate. Just glaring. I bolted out of the kitchen and ran to my other relatives, telling them what happened. I can't really remember what happened next because I basically blanked out. She passed away a few years later. Not sure of what exactly, and I never asked. I just feel sad that the family never really addressed her issues medically, and instead assumed she was under some paranormal influence. 
very late but whatever. When I was eight, my mother had had enough of my abusive father and ran, taking my six-year-old sister and me to live in a car in the middle of Michigan winter. After a week of freezing in the car, which was far better than what was waiting for us at home, we parked in front of a convenience store to rest. Spending her last on gas to keep the car warm I remember telling her no matter what we are better together. As we huddled together keeping warm, we hear a knock on the window which startled us. It's what looks like a bag lady homeless wretch. My mom rolls down the window in this, what I can only describe as a grey apparition hands my mother a large wad of money saying, feed your kids, keep them warm. I looked at my mom and she looked at me like, what the fuck? We both look up and whatever it was is gone. Completely. There's no way she could have disappeared that fast. But she did. Gone. We got a hotel room that night. I, to this day, I'm 38 now, sleep on the same side of the bed that was nearest them that night. Thank you mysterious angel homeless person. Met some random dude while hanging with my girlfriends at BlizzCon one year. While chatting, he seemed like a nice enough student and I offered to stay in touch and give some career advice. About a year later, he went from normal to creepy. Eventually I told him to fuck off and stop messaging me. He found my Skype and contacted me, then my Facebook. I blocked him on everything and figured it was good. He came up to me at another event and seemed to be chilled out. Was polite and kept moving. Now, almost 8 years later, I am on a date when I get an anonymous phone call. I rarely get calls, so I pick up. It turns out to be him, asking where I am. I tell him politely that this is inappropriate and that he shouldn't be calling me. I hang up. And my date gets upset saying that it's extremely rude to answer a phone call without asking permission from her first, and when I explain the story of the stalker, she doesn't believe me and says I made it up to try to impress her. Yeah, I dropped her off at her app and we haven't talked since. GG fucking stalker. When I was in college, I used to leave my dorm room door open, because most of the time my roommate was in the room with me or my best friend was right next door. One day I had to use the restroom, and because it was habit to leave it open, I didn't close the door. I went to the bathroom and came back to my room to find this middle-aged black guy standing in my room. He was clearly not a student, and he was dressed like a homeless man. I stood there for about 10 seconds, trying to figure out if I was seeing things. The guy finally notices me standing there and asks me if he can use my phone. I don't know why, but I told him it wasn't charged, then immediately screamed for help down the hall. The RA and a few of the school's hockey players come running out of their rooms, and the guy books it down a back staircase. I immediately called the cops, and they showed up within a few minutes. They asked for the guy's description, I gave it, and they started searching the other dorms in our quad. He was found in another building, trying to break into a room. Turns out he had a record for breaking and entering, felony assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, and armed robbery. I got a letter in the mail about five years ago letting me know he was up for parole and asking if I'd like to give a witness impact statement. Nope. Back when I was 19, I used to waitress at a shitty truck stop just off the interstate, right across the street from a dive country and western bar. We used to get some real creeps, but this one guy took the cake. I had the 2pm to 10pm shift. I had just walked in, and I noticed a group of the other waitresses standing around a man seated at a table in the back room of the restaurant. I walked up to see what was going on, and they all told me, look at the pictures this guy can draw isn't he great? Sure enough, he had a sketch pad and a box of colored pencils, and he was finishing up a really pretty drawing of a horse for one of the other waitresses. He looked up at me and gave me a really big smile, I could tell he thought I was cute, and then said, hey, can I draw you a picture? Flattered, I told him yes. He went into the front room and took the seat at the far end of the bar, and asked me what I wanted him to draw. Um, how about a pegasus? He said, I can do that, and started to draw. After a while, I noticed that my new artist friend was acting kind of strange. When I walked by, he would ask me if I wanted to see how the picture was coming along. I would bend over the bar to look, and he would say, no, no, come over here and look, and then motion me to come around the end of the bar and stand beside him. I would do this, and he would look around nervously back over his shoulders. Once I caught on, I would look over my shoulders as well, trying to figure out what he was looking at. But I would never see anything, so I would look at the picture and compliment it then get back to work. About six hours into my eight-hour shift, he once again asked me to come take a look at how the drawing was coming along. So once again, I leaned over the bar to take a look, and once again, he told me to come around the end of the bar and look at it from there. So this time, I dutifully trot over to the end of the bar and stand beside him to look at the drawing. And that is when I saw it. He was wearing a pair of coveralls. 
the coveralls had a hole in the crotch, and standing proudly out through this hole was Mr. Artist Guy's fully erect penis. I was so shocked that I didn't say or do anything. I was 19 years old, sheltered and suffering from a severe case of nice girl syndrome. I was more afraid of making a scene than I was of a strange man waving his penis at me in the middle of a busy restaurant. So he stayed and kept drawing, and I kept working. But now, every time I walked by, he spread his legs wide open at me, penis still out and proud. At the end of my shift, he handed the drawing to me. It was a very pretty drawing, to be honest. I took the drawing and told him, you need to go now. I went into the back and counted my tips, clocked out and left, still without saying a word to anyone. I want to smack 19 year old me in the head for being too chicken to say anything. Thank God he wasn't waiting in parking lot for me. I was in boarding school in New Hampshire when a friend and I snuck out to be rebellious, so we went to an old dilapidated graveyard, 1700s 1800s, that was nearby on the campus grounds. We were talking and joking and smoking cigarettes when I feel a tap on the back of my head. I was sitting facing my friend, straddling a stone wall, and there was a full moon and the graveyard was a clearing. I could see everything around me. And there was nothing around me at all. No low hanging branches, no bats flitting around. Seemed weird, but hey, it could have been a big bug or something, so we kept talking. Second time, it came a little harder, so I told my friend, we nervously joked about it for a while and continued on. The third time it hit me, whatever that was wasn't joking around. My friend heard the smack against my head, and we both got up and silently left the graveyard. Seems unreal, and I have not had any supernatural experiences before or since. Truth is, I have no idea what to make of it, but I swear it is true. I was working at a restaurant in NYC at the time so I would usually get home late. It was about a six block walk home from the subway and one night as I turned a corner I saw a tall white man walking towards me on the next block. I'm a six foot tall and about 200 pounds and about 31 at the time. I've been out by myself all over the city plenty of times and have never felt like I was ever in danger, but I don't know what it was about him, but he just struck me as odd. I wanted to avoid him so I crossed the street. Moments after I chose to cross he did as well. Now we're walking towards each other. I don't know what but something is telling me this guy is not okay. We're walking towards each other nearing an intersection that separates us when a group of three Spanish men come walking up the street. I pick up my pace and pass the man when the other three reach the same corner. I keep my head down. I don't make eye contract and pick up my pace. My building is just around the next corner and I already have the keys to the lobby in my hand. I don't look back. As soon as I turn the corner I sprint across the street. I unlock the glass front door as fast as I could and close it behind me. My heart was pounding. I walk across the lobby and hit the elevator button. As I'm waiting for it to reach the lobby I turn around. Standing across the street watching me wait for the elevator was the tall man. Okay, no actual danger here, but it scared the living shit out of me. Like most wannabe edgy 16 year olds, I was into urban exploration. On the outskirts of town, there was a good sized vacant factory that used to make transistors or something. This was to be my big step up from shitty construction sites and vacant houses and stuff. I sneaked out of the house in the middle of the night, equipped with my best tactical cosplay gear. I popped the car into neutral without starting the engine, rolled silently a few blocks down the road, then fired it up and headed out. I parked on a secluded access road behind the factory, and crawled under a fence to get onto the grounds. I had to hunt around for a while, but I eventually found a door with the lock cylinder busted out, located at the far corner of the building. I propped it open with a rock and went inside. The door opened directly onto the factory floor. It was a cavernous, mostly dark space, and completely empty. All the equipment had been cleared out. I set off walking across the middle of the space, shining a flashlight around and taking in the scenery. I was about halfway across the room, no sounds except my own footprints, when it happened. An ear-splitting klaxon alarm went off with no warning whatsoever. It was the sort of thing designed to make a factory full of people working with loud machinery evacuate as fast as possible. The adrenaline hit my system like I had just jumped out of a plane. I spun around and bolted the fuck out of there without looking back. I shot under the fence, jumped in the car, and took off. No cops, no pursuit, nothing but the alarm noise. I went back a couple more times after that. It never happened again. I looked around a bit and never found anything interesting. But, goddamn, that alarm scared the living shit out of me. I'm surprised I didn't literally shit my pants. Not mine but a friend's. This happened several years ago, but I still get shivers when I think of it. My best friend from my other story comes from a big family with six siblings. This story is about her older sister, Sarah. 
Sarah moved to Chicago a couple years out of high school to pursue a theater career, I was still in high school at the time. She lived downtown in the Loop, so she used the L to get everywhere, for non-Chicagoans, the L is an elevated train that runs up in the air above the street level, like all public transit in big cities, the L can get creepy, especially at night. Often homeless people will board and sleep on the L at night when it's cold outside. One night, late, Sarah is riding the L home from work. The car she's in has a few people in it, but as they get off at various stops, pretty soon it's just her, and this person lying down toward the front of the car along those seats that face toward the middle of the car. The person is all bundled up and dirty, quite obviously homeless, and Sarah can't see their face, either because it was covered or they were facing toward the seat back, I can't recall. As she's sitting there, this absolute dread comes over her, and a terrible, irrational thought creeps into her head, that thing over there is a demon. She can't shake this feeling of total certainty that she's in this dirty train car alone with something really evil. She had several more stops, and she wants to get off early, but the idea of getting up and having to walk past this person is terrifying. She keeps getting more and more afraid, until she decides, screw it, I have to get off this train now. So two stops early she stands up and walks toward the door. As she gets close to the person, they look up. It's an old guy, and he gives her this insane creepy smile. She thinks again in her head, that man is a demon, and just as she walks past, the old man nods once and says, still smiling, yes I am. I'm a cashier. A customer came to my register to buy an axe and asked me if he could cut the handle. I told him that while we couldn't cut it for him he could do whatever he wanted with it after he bought it. It was a little odd, but you never know what customers may need something for. He wasn't scary looking either. Just seemed a little tired, a little wired, but nothing too far off of normal. I continued to process the purchase for him and he began to swing the axe in circles. Not large ones mind you, small controlled spins, all while holding eye contact. He started asking me about religion, if I was Christian. It seemed important to him and that that axe seemed pretty sharp, so sure yeah, I'm totally Christian. Want kids? One day, many many years from now. Go to church? Not as much as I should. Then he said, and I quote, you should get yourself to church, you seem like a woman abandoned by God. Oh, I see. This is how I die. Except I didn't, he left and I went on break. So I'm new to Reddit but here goes. I live in the middle of the woods at the end of a dead end street outside Clemson University with a good friend who is also a guy. I do this because the rent for this two bedroom apartment is 250 flat each. A steal. One night I stay up and fall asleep on the couch watching House of Cards. I wake up on the couch at 4 am and think nothing of it. Then our motion light on the porch goes off and through the sliding glass door I see a silhouette of a tall man staring inside. I slowly get off the couch. He knocks but I say nothing. We have curtains so each of us can see the other's silhouette but neither of us can describe the person. I get to my roommate's room down the hall and say Blake there's a guy at our door he looks in his watch and says no there's not and I say there is. Call the cops. So he begins to freak out and calls the cops who say they'll be 30 minutes BC we're so far in the woods. So I go back to the door where this guy's is not left and I say. Hello? He says hey man it's Craig, I don't know any Craigs. I got lost on the river, I don't live on a river I live on a very small pond. Can you lend me some shoes and a t-shirt? I say I'm not going to open the door, I'll see what I have, get off our porch, we watch him and see he has a gimp right leg as he leaves the porch, he's also sopping wet, shirtless, and with no shoes. I find some old sneakers and quickly toss them out the door. He yells back hey man let me give you some money for these I say just stay off our porch the dead end road will lead to a gas station, well then he goes under our porch and I'm really freaking out now, the cops are still 10 minutes away. Five minutes later he comes out and gimps off into the darkness looking back at the house as he goes. In the morning we found out both our bikes with flat tires were under the porch and he was probably trying to see if he could steal those, the cops finally show up and say we are the 10th house he's knocked on and we were the only ones to answer. When I told them there's only one road in and they should have seen him they laughed and said kid, he wanted your shoes to get away back into the woods, he's not on the road so they never found him. We own a shotgun now. My grandfather died last year and I was tasked with sorting some of his belongings. I had always been closer to him than my parents, and they lived in another state. So it was convenient for me to look through his things before my parents could get there, which wouldn't be for another couple of days. I drove over and started exploring the basement. He had always been very fun to talk to because he traveled a lot, but he never really opened up about anything. Whenever I would ask him personal questions about his job, a soldier turned accountant, and how he afforded to travel, he would change the subject. 
so I was seriously looking forward to finding out about his past through his things, as weird as that may sound. He didn't have too many things in the house, but there were a few small boxes and a briefcase tucked away in his personal study in the basement. Two of the boxes were relatively large and covered in duct tape, labeled with the letters ML in black sharpie. I took out my key and started working at the tape. Inside the first box, there was a leather-bound photo album covered by packing peanuts. The first picture was of my grandpa at his high school, with several of his friends. This trend continued for a while, basically a bunch of pictures of him and others. Toward the middle is when the pictures started to get weird, though. There were dimly lit black and white pictures of my grandpa in a suit, sitting at a table in what looked like a castle with stone walls. There were candles on the walls and everyone's face was pretty dark. Then there were pictures of him in a suit in very odd locations. One was him exiting a helicopter near a forest, again in a suit, something he had never mentioned to me previously. Another was of him in front of a very expensive stone mansion, posing with another man in a suit. For my grandpa, these pictures all seemed uncharacteristic of him. I had never even seen him wear a suit, and he lived a pretty modest lifestyle. I guess, for me, these pictures were more confusing than anything because they didn't fit his personality. The trend of him in a suit in odd locations continued. Many of them were in front of expensive buildings or in dimly lit rooms with other, similarly dressed people. In box number two, things got very, very weird. There were a ton of postcards written to him from locations all over the world. He had been a traveler when my grandmother was alive, but he never told me he had made so many overseas acquaintances. Letters from Nepal, France, Russia, and Vietnam were only a few of the locations. Many had pictures of locations I could not identify. There were literally hundreds of these postcards, all with very vague messages written on the back. Some said things like great working with you and others hopefully our paths need not meet again. The vagueness of the messages was disturbing, but every single message had the same exact closing, in blue, ML. I figured the postcards had been sent from the same person, but my grandpa had never mentioned someone with those initials. Digging deeper into the box, I found a few handwritten letters specifically addressing a name that was not my grandfather's. These messages mostly laid out very vague ideas that I couldn't make any sense of. Some included a ton of random symbols, with the same closing in blue, ML at the end of the letters. I didn't know what to make of them. One, though, made reference to something called Monda Ligo, and suggested that things would be changing soon. This letter had been written relatively recently as compared to the others, about three years before he died. It also indicated that his service had been very valuable to them. I was getting so intrigued by all of this. Clearly, my grandpa had been living a very secret life, something I had never heard about. The briefcase remained unopened. I attempted to pry it open with no luck. I tried my hand at the combination, trying his birthday, my grandma's, anything I could. It was going to be a while. I sat down there for what seemed like hours, until I eventually cracked the code and popped it open. I never expected to see what I found. I found literal stacks of currency. There were euros, dollars, pesos, Icelandic kronas, and even a couple of credit cards with the same name used in the letters. Also in the box were two expensive looking blue pens, and a golden button with a cursive ML on it. Two postcards were in the box, one from Iceland and another from Mexico, both not written on. Other than that, the case was empty. I was fascinated. What the hell had my grandpa been involved in? What was Monda Ligo? Should I even be seeing this stuff? I anxiously rushed to my car to get my phone and tell my wife to come over and check out the stuff I found. And here's when this gets legitimately creepy. I sat in the car, parked across the street from the house, and called my wife. I excitedly told her what I had discovered, when a black Lincoln town car pulled in front of the house. Two men exited, both dressed in dark black suits. They looked to be about my grandfather's age. They got out, glanced around, and walked inside. I remember my wife on the phone asking where I was, but I had shrunk down into my seat and gotten very quiet. I was convinced I had never seen these men before. It was hard to see, but there were golden buttons on each of their suits. They walked up to the house, inserted a key in the lock and entered. For five minutes I freaked out. Should I leave? Should I go inside and ask who these men were? How did they have a key? Who were these men? I still hadn't answered my wife's question, and she was getting worried. I said I would call her back and I continued monitoring the house. After the painful five minutes, they came out again, carrying the two boxes and the briefcase. They locked the house door, got directly into the car, and drove off. I freaked out for a long while, but elected not to call the cops. What would I even tell them? Two men entered my grandpa's house with a key. I didn't get a license plate, and had no way of finding the men. So I tried my best to forget about the men, 
but I couldn't shake what I had seen in the basement. I rushed back down there, looking for anything else referencing this Mondaligo. But, alas, there was nothing. The entire house didn't even look lived in. No letters, no postcards or briefcases, just an old accountant's house. I searched online for Mondaligo, and it turns out the organization was a stamp collecting club in the 1950s. Why, though, did my grandpa have all these weird things from them? Could it be that the men were only friends and I was just imagining all of this? No, I hadn't been. On the way to grandfather's funeral, all I could think about was what I had found in the basement. I couldn't shake it, and was searching my phone as my wife drove us there. At the funeral, all of my suspicions were confirmed because two men arrived at the very end of the funeral. After family and friends said their final goodbyes, these two men both walked up to the casket and placed a blue dyed rose on his casket. Immediately, they both left, but not without staring directly at me as they walked away. Looking back, I feel like I definitely should have spoken up. But I didn't and I have no idea who these men were. I suppose this story is more interesting than creepy, but it freaked me right out. Had a nightmare that my six-year-old twin nieces were standing in a kitchen as I watched their faces boil and melt. Told my sister, their mother, about it. Made her paranoid and nieces were barred from the kitchen. A week later her husband is using the one cup coffee maker and it sprays boiling hot water everywhere, thankfully he wasn't in front of it. My nieces always used a stool to watch the coffee maker brew because they thought it was the coolest thing. Then we figured out my sister's coffee maker had been recalled a week before my nightmare. The coffee maker shown in the recall must have been familiar to me but I couldn't remember where I'd seen it. My nieces always wanted to watch every cup that was brewed. I never tied these two things together before the dream. I always thought dreams were pointless. But after this I realized it was my mind filling in the blanks for me. This was about a year and a half ago. I had just had a farewell party with my best friend, and went to bus home. It was about 1.30 in the morning. I get off the bus and walk through the Walgreens parking lot. Someone pulls in behind me and kind of sidles next to me before he parks. I keep walking. About a block away, I hear a pop. I look back and the guy is still in his car with the lights on. I keep going. About a block away from my house I had to cross the street. When I did, the car came down the street out of nowhere and screeches to a halt next to me on the sidewalk. At this point, I'm almost shitting my pants. He said something to me that I couldn't hear so I sternly said no and walked away. I had a choice. I could walk all the way around the block to the front of the house, or cut through the alley and reach my home much faster. I briskly walked into the alley hoping he'd leave me alone. He pulled in behind me. I hear the car door open. I book it. I ran as fast as I could in my whole life and reached my driveway in about 10 seconds. I immediately burst in the house screaming, someone tried to take me. I bought pepper spray and a knife the next day. My friends and I were driving through Arizona after our New Year's stay in Vegas. We had to get home ASAP, because one of my friends had to work. While we were driving through Arizona at about 2 AM, I saw a figure in the middle of the lane just out of the headlights. I was driving and was pretty tired so I thought I was just seeing things and should relinquish the driver's seat. Then suddenly, my friend who was in the passenger seat started screaming and pointing out the windshield. As I'm driving, at approximately 70 miles per hour, there is a naked man walking towards our vehicle, waving around a six-foot-long log. I slammed on my brakes and swerved to miss him. While nearly hitting him, he swings the log at our vehicle and almost hits us. I caught a glimpse of his face. The only way I can describe it is pure rage. After passing him and seeing his face, I gunned it. I looked in my rear view, and the car behind me did the same. There was absolutely nothing for 30 miles in any direction. No cars in the ditch, no houses, and no side roads. When we reached the next town we finally had cell phone reception and tried to call 911. As we were doing that, an ambulance screamed past us going back on the direction we came. Still have no idea what happened to the guy we dubbed Stick Man. We have a good laugh now and again when someone brings it up but I'll never forget the image of his face that I ha e imprinted in my mind. When a friend and I were about 13 we went turkey hunting with his dad. We had a nice spot in some cover behind a fallen tree overlooking a little valley made by the hills. After an hour or so with no luck, my friend and I went to try to find stuff deeper in the woods. There was a lake about 3 miles from the valley, and we were heading towards it to see if we could catch anything drinking. After we got about halfway to the lake, we start to hear weird sounds around us. Branches snapping, something dragging along the ground, etc. As we get closer a tree falls over about 50 yards from us and scares the shit out of us, but we press on. The sounds continued all the way to the lake, but we couldn't see anything. We waited there for an hour before heading back. On our way back, 
we veered a little off of the original path to try to find out what was making those noises. We found tracks. Feline tracks. A mountain lion had been tracking us for about two miles. Our only weapon was my friend's old single-shot 20-gauge loaded with birdshot. If that cat had decided to attack, we would have most likely died. Thankfully, it must have lost interest because we made it back to the hill spot without hearing it again. The family that used to live in my old house, the father was in a bike gang, he had kids and wanted out and to settle down, the gang agreed, and as a parting gift they gave him a nice big TV, told him to enjoy it with his family. The family gathers to try out the new T.V, boom, it was a bomb, the entire family died, he must have been too deep with info on the gang. Flash forward 5 years, some weird stuff happens in the house occasionally, TVs turning on by themselves random times of the night etc. My uncle and I are digging out under the house from the garage to do a bit of work. We found lots of shreds of burned clothes, women, men's, children. This isn't even the creepy part. My little cousin Abby had an imaginary friend in the house, we'll call her Anna. She played and talked with Anna all the time, brought her everywhere. One day we were out and Abby is holding Anna's hand across THR street, we make it halfway when she stops, Anna. Let's go, Abby come on we need to cross, but Anna's not coming. She's gonna get hit. We had to drag her across, she had an absolute breakdown like there was an actual person in the road. I'd guys still haven't forgotten it. A lot of things happen that some people would think haunting at a building I own. Some happened to myself, some to my husband, some to various other people who live there. We only found out this was happening to multiple people after the biggest issue I had with a voice coming out of an unplugged stereo and I went around asking if anyone else had anything strange happen to them. You can believe or you can not. I personally don't believe in this stuff and think it might be like electrical interference or something. I'll try to list them. 1. The hubby would hear a female voice call his name from the first floor so he'd call back, thinking it was me, and find that no one's in the building. Happened 6 plus times. 2. We would wake up in the middle of the night and both hear noises of someone sweeping the wooden floor in the other room. We'd investigate, it would stop when we opened the door. But would start as soon as we went to sleep so we'd get up 3-4 to four times a night trying to find out what it was. 3. A girl who lived there with her boyfriend said she was once woken up from a nap by someone opening the door into their bedroom and shining a flashlight in her face. She thought it was her boyfriend trying to be funny because whoever it was had been tall and wore jeans like her BF. She got pissed when it wouldn't stop so she turned on her light and no one was there. 4. Same girlfriend and boyfriend were play wrestling one day in their room when she thought she'd be funny and try to distract him so he'd lose, so she pointed to a space behind him and jokingly said, there's someone there. All of a sudden, their African grey parrot starts shrieking who's there? Who's there? And the boyfriend, trying to be equally funny, points to the space, which was the doorway, and runs at it yelling you mean here. And the lights not only started flickering, but all the stuff on the shelves in front of him fell off as if he'd spooked something and it fled and bumped into those things. 5. Another couple would set their alarm on their cell phone for work in the morning, but sometimes when they woke up, they'd find they had overslept and the cell phone know where to be found even though it was on the nightstand. They'd look everywhere for it, but wouldn't be able to find it. Finally, they'd give up and when they'd open their locked apartment, it would be sitting right outside their door. 6. So here's the thing that happened that made me go ask around. One day, around 10 in the morning, I'm on my iPad and the hubby is in the next room on his computer. I hear the stereo click on and a female voice starts coming out of it. I don't think anything of it because sometimes he plays music when he's working out so I think that's what he's going to do. I remember distinctly thinking, that's some weird ass indie music he's playing because it was just a girl saying, hi, my name is, I'm from, I'm, years old. I don't catch the specifics because I'm not paying attention but all of a sudden it said, something's hurting me. At that I stop whatever I'm doing on the iPad and peer at the stereo, like, WTF? Then the voice goes, something's killing me. Something killed me. Please, someone tell my parents, tell the teachers, tell the corrections officer. At that point the hair on the back of my neck is standing up and I don't bother listening anymore but run into the other room and flip the fuck out at my husband, cursing him front to back and side to side, like you motherfucker, you don't play jokes about dead people etc. The hubby is confused and slightly miffed because he just got everything from his ancestors to his dick insulted. Finally, he calms me down enough to get it out of me what I heard and he shakes his head and tells me it's not possible. And takes me into the other room to show me he had disconnected that stereo a while ago and it wasn't even plugged in. 7. The most recent thing was a party at the place. There's a back stairwell onto the second floor, along with the front stairwell from the first floor. I went upstairs to get some plates and all the lights were off but I heard footsteps pacing back and forth in the back. 
I can't see anything but think my husband came up from the back to help me with the plate so I call out to him. No response, but a pause slash hesitation in the steps before they resume. I call again and nothing. Finally I turn on the lights and the moment I do, it's like I spook something because all of the plasticware on the racks where I thought the footsteps were fell. I used to live insanely close to Disneyland, which plays a part later on. I was waiting at a bus stop to get home, which honestly was always late, when a guy came up to me and started talking to me. He had on an ACU, army combat uniform, jacket, but sweatpants. He claimed to be military, and claimed that he was working for a nightclub. I knew it was bullshit, didn't want to be blatantly rude or cause issues, don't judge, I was a very non-confrontational teen, so I pretended I was deaf. He continued to talk, and asked me if I wanted to help him attract people to this club he worked for, and I continuously told him no. Long story short, he didn't leave until some of the other people called the police on him, because it was obvious harassment, which may not seem like it, but I'm skipping details, and he left before they arrived. Now this may not seem creepy, but it wasn't until recently I found out about all the human trafficking that actually goes on near Disneyland, and the tactics they use that I realized, I was close to falling into that. I was not 18 yet when it happened. Me and my friends were looking for some good time, experiencing our freedom by doing anything unexpected. We loved tabletop role-playing game and we were looking forward to try some scale role-playing game, you know this kind of events where people get dressed in a place, I would most of the time, for a weekend and share a good RPG scenario. But we were not very wealthy so we began by meeting each other in the wood nearby during the night in some random slash cheap disguise with the kind of weapon you can build with some craft material, like plastic pipes and insulating sleeve. It was like instead of partying at someone's place we were just doing pretty much the same but outdoor. The first rule of the game we agreed to play were quite simple, we had some beer near our fire camp, when we were ready, we took a beer, leave the camp and sneak around in the wood trying to surprise another player and touch him to kill him. When we kill another player, we took his beer and drink it, then he have to go back to the camp to take another beer. So at some point of this night, I get killed and had to find my way back to our camp. I was dressed with a monk outfit with a long brown hood. I get lost without realizing it and find myself by following the light of the fire camp through the trees. When I get close I saw there were people around so I thought to myself it would be fun to scared my friend by suddenly getting out of the bushes screaming. So I did it and realized, but it was too late, it was not our fire camp but some other young fellows chilling out with alcohol and weed. They were literally petrified by my apparition and I didn't know what to do so I ran back in the wood and disappeared. I think that these guys will remember this their whole life. So this story is not about a scare that I had but a scare that I caused. Anyway I had to tell it from my point of view because if anyone tells that from the perspective of the poor fellows I scared, it wouldn't be credible. When I was about 12 years old I had a very vivid dream that I was at the beach on a dock for a family reunion. Everyone I knew was there but I could not find my great aunt. So, I looked all over for her and nobody knew where she was. I went out to the street and there I found my great aunt jogging up to me from the sidewalk. She was wearing jogging clothes and a weird sweatband on her head. She jogged past me and said, I just wanted to say goodbye. Then she jogged off and I woke up. I felt the dream was so real I laid in bed for a few minutes thinking about it. Then I got out of bed and sat on the couch in the living room. My mom came into the house crying and told me and my brothers that her Tanta Inge, that's what she called my great aunt, had a brain aneurysm and was found dead earlier this morning. I could not believe it. I told my mom about my dream and she started to cry again and said that her aunt loved the beach. I don't talk about it very much but to this day one it's of the strangest things to ever happen to me. It makes me believe that there is more to life than the everyday occurrences which we take for granted. So in 2008 to 2009 I lived in Peterborough, Ontario, on Stewart Street which is right near this little park with a creek and like a block from downtown. Across the street was this frat house that had parties like every fucking night, there was almost never not noise for the first several hours after dark. To make it even better, there was a woman I referred to as the chainsaw hooker who used to walk up and down our little street every night alternating screaming at or soliciting people. Her nickname came from a voice that could only be produced by a combination of ceaseless shrieking at people and a half dozen packs of cheap smokes each day. I woke up one night after falling asleep, and it had to be like 2 to 3 a.m., chainsaws at it, screaming at someone while the party across the street dies off. The bed was right against the wall near the window on the second floor, and I look out to see her and another woman staggering down the middle of the road hollering at someone on the frat house lawn. Chainsaw is just cursing a blue streak, and I lay down. This carries on intermittently for maybe 20 minutes. She yells loud enough again that I can make out fuck you. Fucking you don't fucking care if we get raped you fucking, it trails off as I assume she moves further down the road. 
Then I hear a new, very deep voice join the conversation and very threateningly utter if you don't shut the fuck up, getting raped will be the least of your problems. So at this I grab for my cell and sit up to look out the window again, but can't see anyone at all up and down the street. Nothing. It looks utterly deserted. I shiver involuntarily and the skin on my neck pricks. I look at my girlfriend, she's awake, and I can tell she's listening, too. Chainsaw suddenly starts throwing profanity in the direction of the new challenger. A minute at most passes, and all sound cuts out. I don't really know how to describe it, but the deep voice yelled out again and I heard it as clear as though it were in my room. No other sounds, no cars, no wind or other night noises, just you just woke the fucking devil, bitch. Nothing from her in response. The eerie silence just hung there over everything like it was choking the air from us. My girlfriend and I looked at each other, her eyes are wide from behind the pillow she has tucked in her arms, mine probably looked the same. I called the police but couldn't really prove anything violent happened. I want to reiterate though, that we would hear her every night. Every. Night, following that incident, we never saw or heard her again. I'm still not unconvinced I heard her die. I asked my girlfriend about it in the morning to ensure I wasn't crazy, and she remembered the whole thing too. Shortly before I became homeless I went through a period of time where I didn't care what happened to me. Granted, I've never really been in a situation I didn't feel I could turn around, almost got robbed in a bank parking lot, shot at other times, ect. Whatever, so I felt confident but not foolish. During this time I spent much of my day alone. I would run for long distances and commonly took my backpack with me, so I'd have a place to store something to eat and also because 11 miles out of town I found a spot to gold pan that yielded some dust, necessitating panning equipment. One day in late summer I decided to go to a different rest area just to mix it up, further out and secluded, where I'd seen an empty lot that led down to the woods and a large rock field next to the river. It seemed perfect, lots of rocks for possible collection of gold dust from the mountains, and quiet, like I liked it. This time though when I entered the lot there was a car. It was parked in the middle of the lot, toward the water end, and I didn't see anyone in it. Cool, whatever, I walked past and ignored it. At this time I was couch surfing and would sometimes crash with a friend who was in law enforcement. He was nice enough to loan me some cash the next day so I took my crappy dodge down to the new rest stop. Same car was there, nobody in it. I parked a bit away from it but wanted to be close to the water, so, only one spot over, really. That night my buddy asked what I'd been up to and I told him about the car still sitting there. We both laughed that it was probably just abandoned and he said he'd ask if someone wanted to check it out. The next day I jogged back to the new location. I'd found a couple flakes and was stoked for more, hoping to pay my buddy back as quickly as I could, even though he said no. Same car was there. As I went around it I kicked a tire and peered in the back, but the trees made that part of the lot shady and I couldn't see in. I quickly forgot about it and when I got down to the rock field started unpacking my panning gear. I've spent much of my life in the woods, so I heard the footsteps behind me coming over the rock field as soon as the person moved from the tree line. I turned around, and there was a young woman, I would guess early 20s, and she was just staring at me. Now remember, this was about 12 miles out and godforsaken nowhere. Yes there was a road, but this far out it was almost one lane and I frequently saw a deer everywhere and rarely people. I thought maybe this girl was hiking or something. Hey, I said, what's up? She asked me what I was doing and I showed her my stuff. She came right over and we talked for a while about it. I asked her what she was doing. Oh. I'm just camping with my boyfriend. Hey you guys might get along, wanna come meet him? I told her that I was busy panning and I took out my old shit hunting knife and started scraping dried mud off rocks into the pan. She looked at me funny and said she might come back later and see if I wanted something to eat. I nodded and went down to the water to start rinsing the dirt away. I waited until she turned, and I watched her back out of the side of my vision until she was gone. Then I got this really odd feeling. It felt like someone was running their fingers down the back of my neck. A feeling I always take for disquiet slash fear and normally a sensation I listen to, because it doesn't happen often. I immediately put everything back in my bag, slung it over my shoulder, and got the hell out of there. I was so freaked that by the time I got back to my friend's house, I went over to the futon I was borrowing and just lay down, not really understanding what I was feeling, waiting until he got home. Two afternoons later, in which I had gone back to panning at my old spot, abandoning the new one for a bit, my officer buddy comes home super excited. You remember that car you told me about? He said. We checked it out and guess what we found? I'm like, a dead body? He just stared at me for a moment and said, did you look in it? You should have told me there was a dead body in there, I would have looked sooner. It was my turn to stare at him. Really? 
No shit? I didn't know that. I met some weird chick there the other day and haven't been back since then. He asked me to describe her, I did. Oh, we found her all right. She and her boyfriend were camping in the woods a few feet off the road. They were those two the state's been looking for, you know the ones that killed that black kid upstate, the KKK wannabes? The body in the car was her dad, she said she killed him because she thought he was possessed. Must have been a couple weeks back, he was pretty nasty. She was looking for another victim, maybe. You got lucky. When I was in the third grade, I answered the house phone to find my grandpa on the other line. We started chatting and then he asked me if he could walk me to school tomorrow. He lived in Florida and we lived in New Jersey, so I said, no, grandpa, you're all the way in the Florida. But he kept saying that he would be there to walk me to school tomorrow. After we said love you to one another, he hung up. My mom came in and asked who I was talking to. I excitedly told my parents grandpa was coming tomorrow. They were very confused and asked me where I got that idea. I told them that grandpa had called and told me. They called my grandpa, asked if he had called and spoke to me. He said no. I'll never forget the confusion and fright on their faces. Nothing ever came of it, I never walked to school alone after that. When I was in high school I had a sleepover at one of my mates, and we wasted the night away doing what we always did on the weekends. Running amok through the neighborhood, video games, DND, etc. We always set up shop in the basement as to not disturb his parents during the night and this time was no different. We were all sitting around watching a movie when we heard someone messing with the door that leads into the basement. We called through the door to cut it out, because we figured it was his older brother Alan trying to mess with us. When we yelled they stopped for a second and then kept messing with and jiggling the handle. At that point we didn't want to give him any more attention so we just tried to ignore it. The noise continued for a good 5 to 10 minutes until finally it just stopped and we didn't think anything of it. Fast forward to the next morning, well daylight I think it was technically past midnight when we heard the noises, and one of my mates went out the basement door to go to the bathroom, the only other one was upstairs and we were kind of conditioned to go pee outside rather than risk disturbing everyone else in the house, and on his way back and asked my friend what happened to the door handle. Not sure what he was talking about we went to look at it and it looked like someone had taken gouges out of the knob, specifically on the inside portion where the key would go. This was evidently a new development and once his dad was up he told him about it. When his dad saw the door the first thing he did was ask us if we knew anything about it, and we told him about how Alan was trying to scare us last night and that was it. While Alan wasn't home that night, he had left for the weekend. It wasn't until I heard his dad call the police did I start connecting the dots that someone had tried to break into the house. Bad right? Well when it started to sink in that they still tried after they realized we were down there and knew they were doing IT. God makes my skin crawl just thinking about it, I do not want to know what kind of person was on the other side of that do. Once when I was younger, I had to stay over at my grandmother's house while my parents were out of town. Normally I would sleep on the pull-out couch but this time I stayed in my uncle's old room. That night I couldn't sleep. It started to feel weird in the room. It was stuffy, still, and oddly staticky. I started hearing footsteps going from one side of the bed to the other. Then clawing at the carpet. I jumped and pulled my head under the covers and heard something make a sort of hushed laugh. I was too scared to move or sleep the whole night. The sounds continued all night until my grandpa came upstairs to his bathroom around 6 a.m. I told my grandma about it and she thought I was just dreaming about it. I told my mother and she thought the same but jokingly added that my uncle used to play with Ouija boards when he was a kid. A few weeks pass and I have the most graphic nightmare I've ever had. It involved finding a severed head with no skin or eyes on the kitchen table. It was screaming at me. I woke up crying and terrified and told my mom. She gives me this weird look and says my uncle used to have that same dream. One morning, when I was 17, I woke up with this horrible feeling in my chest. It was almost like that tight feeling you get during a panic attack, but worse. For some reason I kept thinking heart attack, heart attack, heart attack. But I kept telling myself that I was too young to have a heart attack, I wasn't showing any signs, and I was just being a paranoid hypochondriac. I kind of just went on with my day from that point, the feeling continued on, never really going away. I was getting kind of worried, but was going to wait things out before I told my parents, they like to brush off my health concerns, but that is another story for another time. Around 7 p.m., I was sitting outside enjoying the summer afternoon and trying to relax to see if that would ease the feeling in my chest, when I heard sirens somewhere off in the distance. I didn't think too much of it, considering the fact that we lived close to a fire station. Sirens weren't all that uncommon, especially in the summer. Skip ahead 20 minutes, I realized that along with the sun, the feeling in my chest was pretty much gone. So I went into the house and, 
as usual, got on Facebook, only to find out that one of my classmates had had a heart attack and had passed away at around 7 p.m., about the time I heard the sirens and the feeling had left my chest. I was kind of in shock to hear such news, because even though he had a heart condition it was still a sad surprise to see that someone my age, who I had known for years, had passed away from a heart attack. It wasn't until a few hours later that I realized how odd it was that I had pretty much sensed the tragedy before it happened. Kind of freaked me out. In Paris while I was abroad, me, my traveling friend and a guy we met at our hostel were biking around the city at night, around 1 to 4 am, we see the Eiffel Tower while we're biking and stop to take pictures, no tourists, it was great, my friends start biking off slowly and I stop to take a few more pictures. I realize they're out of sight and I start biking in their direction and I see the silhouette of a person walking toward me, there's only some street lights and the trees are really obscuring the view, so I bike to the right to distance myself while passing him, it's a two-way path with fencing, and he moves closer to my path. I freak out and start pedaling fast, I cut behind some porto potties, barely fitting, I scrape my hand pretty bad and my other hand graze the fence, that bad, and I look left to see him full on sprinting toward me. I throttle on my bike and this guy continues sprinting after me for a bit, I cut in front of a moving taxi and meet up with my friends, the guy having disappeared. They look bewildered and mention they had a guy pass them in my direction, angrily asked them for money and continued walking. Might not be here today if that gap wasn't there. North London, around 2 am, I'm 16 years old. I just got off the night bus and started walking down a long road to my house. Roads are dead quiet, no traffic. About halfway down the street I hear a noise, I look over my shoulder and see someone across the street further back, walking the same direction as me. He must have come out of a side road or something, because I never noticed anybody until that point. However it wasn't anything out of the ordinary so I kept walking as usual. After about 10 more steps or so, I hear another noise. I look over again, and as I am walking I can see between the gaps of parked cars that the guy is now cutting across the road diagonally walking towards me. However the distance between us is reasonable, and I try not to jump to any conclusions, look forward and walk on. Now I can hear his footsteps speed up and hear him getting closer, now I am aware what's going down and start considering my options. It was an alarming situation, but at the same time not surprising, as robberies were quite common then, especially for mobile phones. My first instinct was to speed up slightly and fix my posture to make myself look bigger, laughable but true. I wasn't too far from my house now bt he was closing in quick and I wasn't sure if I would make it. I wasn't sure whether to turn and confront him or to try to make it to my gate. I picked up the pace and just when it felt like he was on my back I took a quick sharp turn into my gate, and immediately turned round. The guy carried on walking straight on but it was a cinematic slow-mo experience as I caught the light glisten off a large butterfly knife by his side which he then flicked shut and walk away. My pulse was beating as I stood at my gate talking it all in. I went to college in Boston between 2003 to 2007. As a college kid I often stayed up late doing dumb college kid stuff. One weekend my friends and I were making a film for the 48 hour film project. For one of our scenes we needed a nighttime shot, in a dark alley, somewhere in Boston. After driving around for a bit we ended up in Chinatown, found an alley, got our shot, then headed home. Since we were scrambling to get this film done, we were out at 2 or 3 am, there were zero cars out at this hour but being good college students we still stopped at every stoplight. We stop at one red light, just outside of Chinatown, and this very large, very muscular man approaches the car from out of nowhere. He calmly walks up to the passenger door and tries to open it. Thank fucking God we had the doors locked. Once he realizes the doors are locked, he tells us to open the door. We're all frozen with fear, staring at this mega man. This pisses him off, so he starts punching the glass, screaming at us to open the door, trying to get in. At this point the light is still red but I say fuck it, and just take off, leaving the guy in the middle of the street. Never went to Chinatown that late again, ever. This just happened the other day. Definitely one of the creepiest things that's ever happened to me. I work at a bookstore. I'm working alone. It's the afternoon, relatively busy. I'm working on a sale when the phone rings, I pick up without looking as I'm busy with the sale. On the phone is a guy. Normal tone of voice, nothing odd. I ask him what I can do to help, and he says he wants to confirm that he is going to come over at 3 o'clock to spill liquid on our books. Now, my mind is on two things because I'm finishing up this sale, and my first initial thought was he meant he was coming over to put in some mold-resistant liquid, or something, because that's been an issue lately. When the customer leaves, I ask the guy A for more info. He repeats that his name is Tate, he's going to come over to spill liquid on my books, that he had a deal, he repeats this several times. 
I'm obviously confused and ask for his name and phone number so I can call my boss and confirm with her. He's extremely hesitant to give me his number, repeatedly saying the first three numbers before claiming we had a deal over and over. He claims to have spoken with a male employee at my work, there are no male employees here, until I ask does he mean my boss, who is female, and he quickly says yes. At this point I'm getting creeped out and want to get more info in case I need to call the police, because what if this fucker comes over to my store? I try to get him to give me his full name and phone number, but he's being super bizarre at this point, and getting desperate for me to say okay for him to come over, or something. I don't know. He's still being really weird about giving me a phone number. I start freaking out that he is going to come over to the store and do who the fuck knows, and I start telling him not to come over and if he does I'm calling the cops. He's very desperate at this point, sounding adamant that he had a deal and this had been arranged, that he's just going to come over at 3 o'clock, it's almost 3 now, other bizarre shit. I hang up quickly, now starting to hyperventilate, which I've never done. I'm not an easily freaked out person. I call my boss and she of course has no idea who this guy is and says she'll be over in a few minutes. In the meantime I'm all cold and hot and hyperventilating and lock the doors and close the curtains. Freak never shows up, of course, but, damn, that was a bizarre, creepy phone call. Didn't feel at all like a crank call, this guy just sounded so certain. No idea what he really wanted. I've worked a number of phone jobs over the years and never had anything that remotely twilight zone. Years ago, when I was about 20, I lived next door to my father who had some serious health problems caused by complications to diabetes. I did errands for him, some basic household stuff as well as driving him to medical appointments and whatnot. One night, after a day out shopping and doing errands, he wasn't feeling well but had a doctor's appointment the following morning at the Virginia we made plans for me to come over and drive him. I finished up the dishes, gave him a hug and started out the door. He told me to leave it unlocked. I didn't have a key at the time, but it was very unusual for him to request it unlocked. He said, in case he was still in the shower when I came over in the morning. I didn't think much of it. Walked home, had normal evening. Went to bed. About 2 AM I woke up with an agonizing headache, and I was crying. I didn't know what I was sad about. But I was very sad. I wrote in my journal about my mother, who had died several years before. I remember thinking I was sad and missing her. I finally calm myself and get back to sleep. The next morning I wake up late, and check my phone. No call from dad. I think maybe his appointment for change is try to call him. No answer. I start to worry, but think. He's in the shower. I'll just go over. Throw on shorts and run out the door. I let myself in the unlocked door and it's silent. I found him in his bed. He had died in the night, in his sleep. I later learned that his death was probably around the time I had woken crying. Back in January I was driving home from one of my late classes, it's a 5 hour class that gets out at 10 pm, so naturally I was fairly exhausted and it was pitch black outside except for some street lights. On my way home I stopped to get gas, and a drink from a nearby holiday station. Shortly after I got back into my car and back on the road, I felt something against the back of my seat as if someone was pushing against it from the back seat. Because it was late and I was really tired I didn't quite remember whether or not I had locked my car door when I had gone into the gas station, so the whole way back home I was nervously checking my rear view mirror trying to see if there could possibly be anyone hiding in the back of my car. To make matters worse, I keep a large blanket in the back to use for camping, and a person could easily go unseen hiding underneath it. Luckily when I got home I checked every inch of my car to make sure nothing was out of place and it turned out my mind was really playing tricks on me. But goddamn it felt so real. From 1996 to 2000 I lived in a 100-year-old cottage in rural northeastern Scotland, small town called Duras. The town itself was decently populated, main road, school. We lived about 2 km up the road away from the majority of the houses, in a wooded area. We had one neighbor whose house we could see, that's it. It was called a cottage but it was quite a large house, probably close to 3,000 square feet it was the summer cottage of the area Laird. The story was that the Laird's wife had died rather gruesomely in the house and her presence still walks the garden and house regularly. As a 16-year-old I was fascinated by the stories but didn't think much of them. There are still a few articles and stories you can find if you search the Green Lady, though some of them have conflicting information. Strange things happened in the house frequently which I chalked up to it being an old house. Temperatures would vary suddenly, large solid wood doors would slowly swing shut, we could hear mice in the ceiling clearly walking from one corner to the other, the house lights were wired to these old giant fuses that would frequently blow and require replacement, our dog would growl and stare at thin air. It was the type of place that could be incredibly warm and cozy one second, and in an instant it's cold and barren. 
We would often get goosebumps for no reason at all, and occasionally felt like somebody was watching us. I can't explain this feeling properly, but it was horrifying. You always hear about people's reactions as being fight or flight, but this was sheer terror, you couldn't move. I lived here for four years with my family, my dad never seemed to experience anything, though he did hear the mice. My brother felt uneasy and we talk now about some of our odd experiences there. My sister was younger and also remembers the house to be creepy. My mom, who stayed at home alone during the day, refuses to talk about it to this day, though she has told me two things that happened to hear there. One was when she was lying in bed she would hear footsteps walk across her bedroom floor from her ensuite to the front door. Clear footsteps, normal pace, walking. One time the footsteps stopped at the bed and the mattress depressed as if someone had sat on it. She has experienced lots more there that she does not speak about. One night my parents and younger sister were out for the night, my brother had since moved out on his own. It was probably close to midnight or 1 am, I was sitting alone on the main floor in a room directly below my mom's bedroom. I heard the mice in the ceiling shuffling around, it only lasted for a few seconds. I then heard footsteps from the my mom's bedroom directly above, moving from the ensuite to the front door. I waited and heard nothing else. I got up, went to see if it was the dog that was moving around up there, she was lying on the couch at the bottom of the stairs. Quite scared now I got a knife from the kitchen and went back into the room below my mom's bedroom. About two to three minutes later I heard footsteps begin coming down the stairs, slowly. I heard a faint old woman's voice, and the sound of a clammy hand rubbing on the wooden handrail of the stairs. My heart racing I stood up with the knife to go see what was happening and before I could get to the door of the room I was in, all the lights in the house went out. I fell to my knees and about 5 seconds later the lights came back on as if nothing had happened. If you had asked me before living in this house if I believed in ghosts, I would have said no. Ever since that night my view has changed completely. Since we moved out in 2000 there have been two or three owners of the house. I haven't been back in a long time but I have heard the house has since been torn down. Little layout first, I grew up in the southern US out in the countryside. My family didn't grow up on a ranch, but all the surrounding property was ranches slash farms. Now, I don't wear any redneck attire, I just grew up that environment and I understand the lifestyle. Growing up we, me and my three siblings, always heard the craziest campfire stories that you could possibly imagine. My father was a drunkard and like most old men of the south, has a fascination with all sorts of mythological creatures. From Bigfoot to skinwalkers, my father and his friends always enjoyed telling their skin-crawling stories at the campfire. So this is where my story begins. I was in my second year of university spending the evening at home drinking and carrying on with my siblings and friends. My parents' home was on a plot of about 7 acres of land, 5 acres of which were thick overgrowth and forest where back of the property sat up against a slough, small river, which led from the local state park. Many small bears, bobcats and the likes would make their way from the state park and cause hell to the small wildlife on my property. So on this particular weekend, several college friends came home to my place to see where I grew up. We spent the day setting up for the bonfire in the backyard and slowly transitioned into drinking. It was starting to get late and alcohol was beginning to kick in. As the night was going on I continuously heard something walking around in the wooded area behind where we had been drinking all night near the bonfire but thought nothing of it because raccoons, armadillos and the likes were always scrounging around in the woods. Eventually, one by one, my friends began to head off to the house to get some sleep. It was around midnight and it ended up just being my younger brother, the family dog, myself and a friend of mine from college. We were finally letting the alcohol soak, and anyone who has been drunk at a bonfire knows what I'm talking about. After everything has settled and the rowdy have hit the hay, the few who have lasted this long decide to completely shut up, sit in front of the fire and just drool in a drunken stare and listen to the fire crackle. We were all pretty much in this state when I heard someone walking around in the forest directly behind us. This time it was very loud and distinctly different than any of the sounds I had heard previously. This sounded a lot like a someone, not something. Anyone who was raised outside of the city can pretty much easily tell the difference between a four-legged animal and a two-legged animal walking through brush, e, timing in between steps, dragging sounds, etc. So I knew whatever it was was bipedal, at least from my knowledge of animals in the area. With several small break-ins to the family boat and car, I figured some jackass kids were trying to freak us out, it's not unheard of, but many of the families around us had many, many guns and this behavior was pretty much unheard of in my neighborhood, but sometimes kids do dumb shit, right? My younger brother had just had a birthday and received a huge spotlight from his girlfriend, remember we're country bumpkins. When this thing was turned on it looked like the sun itself had turned on. It lights up everything. So as I listened to these little shits pander around on my property, 
I wasn't about to let them continue with their little game. I gather the spotlight and collect my thoughts, I am covered in goosebumps typing this, my dog, the most passive and loving German Shepherd in family history, starts to give off a low growl. My dog doesn't growl. At anything. The only time you hear our dog growl is if someone is posing a threat to my little brother, whom the dog was closest with. I hesitated only momentarily, but when my brain comes down to fight or flight, it tells me to run screaming with my fists cocked, stupid probably, but that was my reaction. I yank the gigantic spotlight up from my side, grab the most seemingly useful stick I could and I give my dog the whistle to chase. Now here is where everything I know is totally fucked, makes no sense and makes me truly question everything that happened that night, my dog storms off into the woods like he always does on a chase whistle. But then you hear the whine, that heart-wrenching, gut-clenching whine of a dog in pain. Now I was chasing behind my dog, I did not send him in alone, but obviously a dog is faster than an overweight college kid. As I am passing the barrier into the woods, my dog comes bounding back out, tail in between his legs. As he makes his way past my legs, I come through the clearing where the sounds were coming from. And my spotlight dies. It literally makes an audible hum and dies. IT turns off. Whatever was walking in the woods and making all those sounds was feet, if not inches, in front of me. The hair on the back of my neck stood up and I swear to God, everything in my body told me to run, but no form of convincing allowed my body to move an inch. This entire event unfolded in less than 10 seconds. After several seconds of listening to this thing trample through the woods in front of me, the spotlight slowly beams back on and illuminates the woods in front of me. Whatever it was had just enough time to get out of range of my beam and disappear. I searched for tracks in the muddy forest growth, but to no avail. So obviously I grabbed my dog, my brother and the rest of my things and I got the FCK out of Dodge. I have no clue what or who that was on my property that night, but nothing made sense and the sequence of events was so off-putting I get sick to my stomach just thinking about the entire thing. I obviously don't run around screaming about mythological creatures, but it really makes me double-check sounds I hear out in the woods at night. When my daughter was small, she had an imaginary friend called Mr. Johnson, we always had to leave room in the car for him and lay a place at dinner etc., all was fine until Mr. Johnson started being mean to her, she said he wouldn't let her sleep and kept saying mean stuff to her in the night. I asked her what he looked like and she described him as having a white face with black eyes and black hair and a black mouth. Creepy yeah but it was just a kid's imagination, until a friend of mine came over with her little boy, who, upon entering my house began to scream and cry, he wouldn't put his feet on my floor, was literally climbing him mother's legs and was shouting about the scary man in the corner. Mr. Johnson disappeared after we went for a drive one day and he apparently didn't make it back to the car in time when we came home. I worked as a hostess at this upscale brewery slash restaurant for a brief time back in college. I was 19 at the time and I've always been a very petite and had gotten used to dealing with annoying dudes hitting on me or making inappropriate comments here and there after having one too many beers, this was in an Arizona college town so there were plenty of idiots even at a more upscale establishment. Guy co-workers were always super supportive and protective of me and my fellow female co-workers, so it never really bothered me slash always felt safe. Until this one night. Was halfway through my shift when this guy walked in and from the moment I saw him I just had this strange creepy feeling. The way he looked at me, way too much eye contact with his creepy half smile. When he walked up, he asked for a table of for one so I proceeded to take him a spot far from where I was, but he abruptly stopped at the first table closest to the host stand to ask if he could actually please sit there as he'd prefer it. Again, I had this overwhelming strange urge to get as far away from this dude as possible and just tell him no. But the floor manager was next to us and said of course before I could react. He sat in the chair facing the host stand and for about an hour just slowly drank two beers while staring at me. Not checking his phone or watching the game. Just looking at me. I got hit on all the time at this place, wasn't a big deal, but something about this dude just made my internal alarm go nuts. Couldn't put my finger on why exactly but something about him just felt off. Was so creeped out the whole time he was sitting there that I had literal goosebumps. Then as he gets up to leave I started to feel this excited relief yay it's over, but right as he passes me, he abruptly turned back around with this terrifying smile, leans in across the host stand towards me while making direct eye contact, then pausing for a moment before flashing me this look of pure evil, stone cold rage while he quietly whispering, I'll be waiting for you black Honda, car I drove at the time. Then he flashed me that awful creepy smile again and walked out. Sort of laughing to himself. Petrified, I immediately told the guys on my team who all vowed to walk me safely to and from my car each night moving forward. First few nights, there was no sign of him. Stared to feel like maybe I'd gotten overexcited about the situation, but then on the third night, 
There he was, sitting in his car parked right next to mine. Guy I was with scared him off, but for the next month or so I'd catch little sightings of him here and there. He was definitely stalking me. Thankfully I moved away that next month halfway across the country and that was the last of that, but man I still think about it and look over my shoulder from time to time. Convinced that dude wanted to wear my skin. This isn't creepy in the traditional sense, but my mother and I both did feel that dawning horror when we realized what happened. My father died when I was four years old, and I barely remember him. My mom had some experiences of her own in the year or so after that, but this happened my senior year as we were packing up to move me to college. For background, my dad wrote my name on an old CD case when I was young, and my mom had dug it out of her closet earlier that day so his handwriting, especially my name, was fresh in her mind. Additionally, I was a big fan of Harrison Ford since I was 13 and had received two signed photographs of him that I didn't remember soliciting but was happy to have nonetheless. Flash forward to the packing, I took the photos out of the envelope and left it on the desk while I stored the pictures with the other ones. My mom was puttering around criticizing my packing but then stopped dead at my desk. She said, Darby. Where did you get this envelope? I was confused and reminded her of when it arrived from California, and then asked her what the big deal was. She took me upstairs and showed me the CD case, it was the same handwriting. No wonder I didn't remember soliciting them. I didn't. It was night time in Detroit. Me and my mom had just moved into our new home a few days before, and I was enjoying a nice slumber until she woke me up at around 0200. Coach Sum, are you awake? My mom whispered. Yeah? What's up? I whispered back. My mom hesitated as if she was listening for something. Do you hear anything? She finally said. I hated my mom at the time because we just moved to a shitty area, so I thought she was being ridiculous. No I don't hear anything, you're being crazy. I could have swore I heard something downstairs, she was cut off by a noise downstairs. I couldn't believe it, our house was being broke into. What the hell do I do now? I'm just some kid. I grabbed my pellet gun and brought my mom into my room. I guarded the hallway leading to my room while my mom called for the police. I was so scared that I wanted to cry. But I knew if I missed the one shot loaded into my pellet gun, then we could be in deep shit, so I put all my focus into guarding my room door. I heard quiet footsteps down at the bottom of the stairs, you could tell that whoever was down there was trying to be sneaky, and that it was a miracle my mom heard them and woke me up. Guarding that door seemed like hours had passed, but in reality it was only about 15 minutes before I saw cop lights through my window. The footsteps slowly faded until I couldn't hear them anymore. The cops knocked on our door, so me and my mom slowly made our way to the front to answer them. My mom told them about the situation. Were the noises just on the first floor? They asked. Yes, we were upstairs watching the hallway up there, she replied. So the police did a quick once-over of our ground floor, found nothing and told us it was probably just the house settling. They tried comforting us and reassuring we were safe. My mom bought it, but me? I was sketched out, I knew what I heard. The next day when my mom was at work and I was by myself, right when I woke up I grabbed my pellet gun and a kitchen knife and started clearing every inch two of our home to make sure nothing was hiding in a corner waiting to kill me. I checked the upstairs first, it was all good. I checked the ground floor again, everything seemed fine. Besides a chair in our backyard was knocked over. I was getting suspicious and nervous. There was only one floor left to check, the basement. I had only been down there once since we had moved in. It was dark and damp down there, and the staircase leading down to it was off to the side, inside the house. I walked up to the door and looked at it. Do I really want to clear the basement? What is something is down there? I went against my judgment and opened the door. I couldn't believe what I saw. There, clear as day, were footprints and an ass print on the carpet on the stairs, pressed into the carpet. Whoever was in the house last night took cover and sat on the stairs right inside my basement door while the cops searched the ground floor. I was horrified and creeped out beyond belief. Pretty short story. I was walking home and just before I turned the corner into a long walk that goes into the courtyard of my apartment building, I passed a man walking the opposite direction. I don't know exactly what it was, but something scared me about him, like his body was poised to jump me or something. So I turned the corner onto the walk, and picked up a rounded stone, turned around, and waited. He came around the corner, saw me, and froze. Note he would have had to turn around to turn this corner, like he had decided to follow me. I made sure to stand with the stone just so, so it was unmistakable. But I didn't raise it or anything, just stood there with it like I'd carried it my whole life. He said what are you doing with that? And I said I'm just standing here, he said well what are you doing here? And I said I live here. 
What are you doing here? At this he just muttered something and walked on in the original direction he'd been headed when we passed on the sidewalk. I put the rock back in the landscaping and went inside and started shaking. When I was six or seven, I woke up in the middle of the night. There was a massive thunderstorm with heavy rain, and the noise woke me up. I got out of bed, wrapped myself with a piquet blanket and walked towards my parents' bedroom. The door was locked, and I realized they were asleep and decided not to wake them up. I walk instead to the living room, to watch the rain and lightning, when I spot some person running in the street looking for cover. I felt bad for him, getting drenched like that in the rain without an umbrella when he suddenly gets hit by lightning. I was so scared by the loud noise that I closed my eyes and looked away for a couple of seconds, reflex. I look back and I see him laying on the floor, smoke rising from the body. I'm not 100% sure he died, but I remember going back to bed pretty shocked and it was in that fateful night that I questioned the existence of God, why God kills people, etc. When I was living with my parents, my room was at the bottom of the stairs that is right beside the back door. My dog at the time, a super cute basset hound, had a bad habit of barking at my room door in the middle of the night until I let him in to cuddle. I was trying to get Ted, the doggy, to stop doing that, so I started ignoring his barks. One night he was just going insane, running up and down the stairs and all around being a psycho. Eventually he stopped after I lost my patience and went and yelled at him to cut it out. The next morning I go to let him out and there is muddy boot prints all over the outside of the back door. Additionally the frame of the door was cracked and broken. Someone had tried to break in through our back door and Ted must have scared him off. It was just me and Ted that night and I was in high school so I was spooked to say the least. This happened last year with my girlfriend at the time. We were in Hyde Park, which is like the Central Park in Sydney. They have these public toilets that require a cleaning cycle to go through each use. So I've just finished my business in the toilet and the door is still open but it's not ready for use as it has to go through its cleaning cycle. An old Asian lady walks in and the door closes behind her saying cleaning cycle in process. I'm laughing with my girlfriend about how she might come out soaked act, so we wait to see her come out, but that's the thing. She never comes out. We were watching the whole time and no one left. The door opens ready for someone to enter after the cleaning cycle and a man just walks straight in. There is no sign of the lady. So I do some investigating about it. What's messed up is there is pressure senses in the toilet that causes the door to open automatically if someone enters while it's meant to go through a cleaning cycle and this lady walks right in with nothing happening. This was some A-grade crazy stuff, we were just standing there thinking JK Rowling isn't fiction, the magic world is real, she went to the bureau via the toilet. I was living in a studio apartment, a glorified converted tenement, really, in a gentrifying neighborhood, in an especially crappy part of a major US city about a decade ago. I had a great steady girlfriend who would often spend the night. One day, I got a knock at my door. It was a woman slightly older than me who lived upstairs. We weren't friends but acquaintances enough that I knew she was pretty grounded and level-headed. I heard what you did she told me. Puzzled, I asked what? She went on to tell me she had heard me beating my girlfriend within an inch of her life and her crying for help. I told her I had no idea what she was talking about but she would have none of it and reiterated that I was full of it, a wife beat her and she would be sure to call the cops. Over the next few weeks, she had daggers in her eyes every time I saw her and over time I started to sense suspicious looks from others in my building. I became a puddle of nerves and never wanted to leave my apartment. Finally, a month or two later, I get another knock on my door one afternoon. Pastelnesty, I am so 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 sorry. Turns out there was some issue with sound carrying in an old duct or something. A guy in a different unit had, indeed, been beating a woman mercilessly elsewhere in the building and, one afternoon, my neighbor had heard it again, gone to investigate slash intervene and put the pieces together. My then girlfriend had a laughing fit when I told her what had happened and couldn't understand why it had creeped me out so much. But that feeling, of being completely innocent but having someone believe you are the devil incarnate, and all while living in a tiny shitty shoebox in a rough neighborhood was enough to nearly give me a heart attack. When I was 12 years old, me and my parents were going to visit relatives in Tennessee. On the way there, we were driving across this really long road surrounded by nothing but trees and miles of forestry. We were pretty much the only car on the road at the time too, and it was pretty scary. The scariest part though is that halfway between the exit and the entrance to this long road, there was a gas station. Our tank was almost empty so my grandpa decided to stop and get some gas from the place. It was somewhere between 1.30am and 2am, we got a late start, and I whined a lot at age 12. I was busy whining about being hungry, and it was one of those gas stations where you had to go inside to pay for the gas. So my grandma decided to take me inside with her and my grandpa to pay for the gas and get a snack for myself. 
When we got up to the counter to pay, the man behind it, his eyes were really sunken and dark and had circles all around them. He looked really sad, and I remember his shirt had a large hole on his left arm sleeve. It didn't seem right to me, so I wanted to get out of there as quick as I could. Before my parents could really pay for it, I told them I was going to go and wait in the car because they had a few extra snacks for themselves. My grandpa gave me the car keys, so I hurried quick and unlocked the car door. When I looked up, to the very far left of the gas station, I shit you not, there was just a man standing there. The thing about this man though was that, I once again shit you not, he was wearing an old, torn up, and muddy clown costume. I'm not kidding. He just stood there, with a large grin on his face and stared at me, and I stared back at him, scared shitless. My parents came out shortly after that though, but they didn't even seem to notice him. I swear to God this is 100% true, and the next day upon waking up I asked my parents about it and they said I must have had some sort of nightmare, because we never actually walked into the station, and it really wasn't one of those walk-in to pay. It's the creepiest experience of my life, and I'll never forget. I still can't make sense of it. When I was 19 2005 and had just graduated and gotten my first job, I was real happy. It was a night gig packing deliveries for a delivery truck company. I started at 2 a.m. This first night I was eager to get there so I arrived at work at 1.15. Little did I know that the place is completely empty at that time and that the manager comes in at 1.55 to open up for us. It was five employees doing the night gig. Anyway, I sat outside this desolate big old warehouse in the middle of nowhere, in my car, when I see another car driving past on the small road a few hundred yards away. I remember thinking that maybe it was a colleague coming but it just kept driving past me. A few minutes later the same car coming back the other way, just stopped in plain sight of me. Now I'm thinking that it's definitely a co-worker, but the car never drives up to me, it's just standing there, on the road, looking at me. I got a weird feeling immediately and I decided to drive away and keep circulating until the manager comes. As soon as I start the engine and drives off, the other car starts following me. I drive for 10 minutes, while calling my aunt. Both my aunt and uncle are police officers. She tells me to do all the procedures she's taught me four left turns etc, to make sure I really am followed before she tells me to call the cops. This is a few miles outside of a big city but I guess I lucked out because the operators say that they have a squad car in the area. She directed me into a well-lit area and told me to park. At this time I was seriously questioning this idea but she told me to trust her. As soon as I park, the car that's been following me for nearly 20 minutes now, stops right behind me. I am freaked out of my fucking head right now and all I want to do is drive, fast as fuck. The operator asked me to stay still and if they open their doors, I should get the hell out of there. As soon as she said it, the doors open. Not one fucking second later I rev the engine and as I drive off I see in the rearview mirror how two police officers, with pulled guns bolt towards the, now open car. Turns out that this car belonged to a meth head and he and his buddy had been driving around looking for something fun to do. There was two axes, a saw, a shovel and some other pretty fucked up things in this car. I never saw the car or them again. In 2007 my aunt comes to me and tells me that this meth head had been brought in as prime suspect of a murder and a drug deal gone wrong. He was convicted. A lot of strange things happened in my dad's house growing up. My bedroom was above the laundry room in the basement. One night, I kept hearing the sound of the light, it was just a bulb with a pull chain, very distinct sound, repeatedly being turned on and off. I looked outside, since that small window was right below mine, and the light was off, all while hearing that noise over and over and over again. I woke up once in the middle of the night because I smelled intense electrical burning. Very very strong. I laid in bed and sniffed a few times to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I got up with the intent to run to the kitchen, took two steps, and there was no smell. I immediately thought it was from the plug with my AC. I went and felt the area, ice cold. I brought my face back around my bed, no more smell. This was all in the span of about 10 seconds. I was really really confused. I laid back in bed and heard a laugh from above my head and then I smelled a very strong perfume. So bad, I had to get out of bed. Again, I took a few steps, and smell nothing. Brought my face over my bed, no smell. I went into the living room and watching TV the rest of the night. My dad got a new dog and, for some reason, it didn't like me. It always looked at me funny and would lean away from me. One night I had my boyfriend and his friend over to watch movies, my dad was in the computer room right next to us. The dog was sitting by my BF's friend and he starts growling at me. The friend put his hand on the dog's collar and tried to calm him down by petting him. The dog's growling grew louder and more intense. I heard the friend say, get her. And the dog lunged for me. 
The friend yanked on the collar, threw the dog aside, smacked his nose and said, No. I look at him and screamed, What the fuck did you just say to my dog? He looked startled and said, No. I yelled, No, asshole, before that. He looked at my boyfriend, looked at my dad, and then looked back at me. I said, Calm down. The fuck you did. My boyfriend looked at me and said, He did. I heard him. My dad said, I heard him say it too, and I was on the computer. I looked at my dad and said, he said, get her. Nope. He said calm down according to the very confused men in the room staring at me like I had six heads. Once I woke up with tiny scratches all over my body. The kind you get when you scratch yourself with a thumbtack. Tore my bed apart looking for the source of the scratches. Found nothing. Those are the more intense stories. Hearing voices and noises was commonplace in that household. There's a very old man who lives next door to the house my friends and I rent. I'm fairly certain he's senile slash has some sort of dementia, which is of course extremely tragic, and I truly feel for him if he does. Several times after we moved in, we'd be driving back from somewhere and we'd catch him standing on the sidewalk, our houses are up on a hill, so down the driveway from his house, just staring off down the street in our house's direction. Never moving. Never doing anything. Just staring. And he'd do it for a while. Now, this always occurred during the daytime. Last May, I brought my childhood dog down from my parents' house to live with us. While he hated walks back there, he has a big fenced-in yard both at my parents' and my house, he seemed to want to go on them while with me. Not a big deal, it was summer so it was warm out and light late. One night, I took him for a walk. Later than usual, around 9 p.m. We walked past the old man's house and then a few more than took a left to make a loop around the block. I noticed it was somewhat strange that night. My dog kept stopping while we were walking and a house on the block behind ours had an eerie flickering light. But it's a short walk, nothing too bothersome. But we get up the hill behind the house, and start coming down the street next to the house, we live on the corner. My dog acted kindly of weirdly with our yard after I moved him down. There are two gates on the back left corner, and two gates on the front right corner. No matter what I did I couldn't convince him to go around the back of the house for some reason. He may not have liked the gravel back there or something, not sure but he would genuinely dig into the ground and not allow you to drag him through the back gates. This dog is a less than 20 pounds Jack Russell, and his resistance to going back there was strong enough that I, a 23-year-old male, couldn't move him. Which meant I had to take him down around the bottom of the hill into our driveway to come up the front. So we go around the corner and I look down the street. Standing under the streetlight, completely unmoving, is the disheveled old man. Just staring in my direction. Right at me. Y'all, I don't think I could have turned around quicker. I literally had to drag that damn dog through the back gate. My roommates were about as distraught as I was when I told them. It just makes me sad that he is actually probably senile and didn't really have a reason for doing it. But it thoroughly unsettled me. I think I was in high school at the time, around 17 or 18. I drove to baseball practice in the afternoon and things were completely normal. My car had well over a quarter of gas in it by the time I got to the field, this comes into play later. Anyways, practice ends and my buddy and I decide to stay after to work on our game. We ended up being out on the field until well after dark and the lights had come on. We were so busy doing our thing that by the time we finally packed it in, it dawned on me that the atmosphere had completely changed. It had gone from a bright and sunny day, to completely dark and a thick fog had rolled in. Visibility wasn't much more than 50 to 100 feet. Now I didn't think much of it as we were getting into my car, I was driving my buddy home, but it all started to feel incredibly creepy when I turned on my car and the gas light immediately went on. Nearly out of gas. I was dumbfounded and also a bit creeped out. Anyways, we were in a part of town where there wasn't a whole lot out there, and it was a good couple of miles to the nearest gas station at least. Meanwhile this was before I had a GPS or phone with location on it, so I had to rely on where I thought the gas station was. I think the creepiest part, aside from my gas suddenly disappearing without notice, was how deserted everything seems to be. No one out and about, just dark and foggy as fuck, all while trying to get to a station before running out of fuel. We find a station, and I kid you not, I did not want to get out of the car. No one in sight, and a thick fog all around, and I was already creeped out by the whole gas thing. Anyways, I get out of my car, trying to play it cool because I was, after all, with a friend. I start pumping my gas and a guy start walking up to me from the corner of my eye, and I wasn't really sure where exactly he had originated from. This is probably because the fog was so thick that I hadn't seen him when I first got out. Anyways, 
I tried to figure out if I should just jump into my car and take off, and play it cool and hope for the best. But I didn't have much time to think about it and the guy was too close to do anything about it. Turns out the guy was homeless and or very poor and looking for money. I was so shaken that I said I didn't have any money on me, and he left rather quickly. We ended up driving back to his place without further incident. But the series of events made everything incredibly creepy and unnerving. I thought for sure the guy had emptied my tank and it was all part of a much greater and diabolical plan when I saw him walking up. In 2012 I was in a bad place in life and didn't make the best decisions, hitchhiking was one of them. At this time I lived 15 minutes outside my hometown on a reservation where everybody knew everybody else. I was never too worried as I only took rides to and from town from people I knew. I know this mindset doesn't justify hitchhiking in any way whatsoever, it is scary and is super dangerous and I'm lucky to be alive being so dumb to even do something so risky. One night, I was supposed to meet a friend, they flake out once I get into town, didn't want to wait around for a different friend to get off work for a place to stay so I decide to brave the hitchhiking spot. It was December in British Columbia, as cold and dark as your ex's heart. I was alone and unafraid, until I heard someone, something whistling at me from the pitch black trees slash fields. At first I didn't think anything of it, I thought somebody may be making fun of me or something, so I got annoyed and kept trudging forward in the snow. Mind you I'm nearing total and complete darkness, there were only three more street lights left than it's just the night sky to guide you for the next five or so km till the next set of street lamps. Any woodle, I thought the whistle was probably some loser on his patio at first. But it was so loud. I got to the second last lamp, and I heard it again. In the trees, following me. I kept walking still not really registering what was happening till I got to the last street lamp. I got to it contemplating what to do, and I heard the whistle again right next to me, across the road and into the field. Far enough into the shadows for me not to see them. At that moment I was just pumped with so much fear, why are they following me? What should I do? I was shaking. The whistle was strong, loud, and one long note if that makes sense. The last time I heard it my gut just screamed something is wrong, this is wrong. I was stuck. I'm so far away both ways, where do I go? As I was just deciding to book it back towards the light slash houses a car pulled up. It was my brother's best friend and his mom. I can't even explain to anybody how much of a relief it was to feel saved from such a creepily weird situation. I didn't tell them anything, I do have other stories but this is always the first that comes to mind. Was it a creepy feller? A squatch? A bird? Lol I don't fucking know. But I was scared. Many years ago, the summer of 1987, me, my girlfriend, her sister and boyfriend were walking back to her parents' house late at night having been out on the town. As we passed a phone box it started to ring so I answered it and there was a very effeminately voiced man who asked if we'd been out and whether we'd had a good time, nothing creepy, just a bit odd, and then he said he wanted to speak to the pretty girls. We presumed it was someone who was watching out of one of the houses that overlooked the phone, of which there were many, so knew there were two guys and two girls but we couldn't tell where exactly he was. We thought it was quite funny and the pretty girl spoke to him for a few minutes as he asked vague questions about how old they were and what their names were etc. After a while we got bored of the game and hung up and carried on walking. The really creepy part was that as passed a phone box about half a mile later it rang and it was the same guy with the same monotonous effeminate voice wanting to speak to the pretty girls again. This freaked us out and we hung up and carried on walking. The next phone box we passed it rang again and by this time the girls were really freaked and scared so we didn't answer it. We virtually ran home from there, not actually passing any other phone boxes, so got back without any further incident. There was absolutely no way that anyone who lived overlooking the first phone box could have seen us at the second or third phone box and he could never have guessed which phone box we would be passing as there were many potential routes and phone boxes we could have passed. The obvious solution is that it was someone following us with a mobile phone. But thing is, this was 1987 which was well before mobile phones were popular and everyone had them. As I recall they existed but only in films, think the walkie-talkie type phone with a suitcase battery pack as used by Gordon Gecko in Wall Street, and so were the playthings of the very wealthy and certainly not available to normal people. Also, how did he know the number of the phone box we would be passing at a particular time? Also, there was no one around. No one. The route we walked had clear lines of sight in every direction and as far as we could tell we weren't being watched. Very weird. This is a paranormal creepy thing and not even the most outrageous paranormal thing that's happened to me but still gives me shivers. I was visiting my parents who had moved back to Oahu from the mainland after I graduated high school. After a few nights of sleeping in the guest room, I told my mom I was getting very little sleep and when I did sleep, I was always having terrifying nightmares, I just felt uncomfortable there. 
She was confused because everyone else who had stayed in that room loved it and said the room felt so homey. But I just couldn't shake that uncomfortable feeling and mostly fell asleep out of exhaustion rather than peace. One night, I wake up from a weird feeling someone was watching me. I look at the short little white curtains in the windows and they are sticking straight out, waving a little, but almost horizontal. Then I look at the foot of my bed and there's a man standing there. I think at first that it's my dad, which would have been creepy enough for him just to be watching me sleep. But as I focus, I realize that through this man's yellow shirt, I can see the door knob. Then I look up towards his face and see that he doesn't have one. Or a head. I passed out from fear. I woke up the next morning not remembering anything but slowly throughout the day it came back to me. I know I wasn't dreaming. I know it like I know I'm not dreaming now. Still the creepiest thing to this day. Finally this question gets asked. I have been waiting with this story for so long. So it was an early in the morning, somewhere around 5 am. My girlfriend and I are woken by the faint sound of what sounds like static or interference, something, coming from my phone on the bedside table. We are both really groggy at this point and I'm thinking it must by my alarm beginning to go off so I reach for the phone to hit snooze. When I pick up the phone and look at it, the alarm hasn't started, the screen is still black, and through the static I hear this faint voice calling mother, mother with drawn out R's and different inflections, like questions every now and then. The voice sounds like a young boy in the distance who is lost and looking for his mom and it just kept coming for a good 5 minutes. I turn on my phone and there is no app open. There is no YouTube video or ad playing in the background and all the while, the child's voice just keeps calling for its mother until it slowly receded into static, then finally silence. The crazy thing is, in our drowsiness, we both just wrote it off and went back to sleep. After my actual alarm woke us a few hours later, we realized that was the single creepiest thing we will ever experience. I still don't have a valid explanation to this day. A few years ago I was studying abroad in France. One weekend I had plans to visit some friends in Amsterdam and I was traveling alone. I took a train to Basel, Switzerland and got in a little too late to the airport and had missed my flight so I had to book another one but unfortunately the next flight wasn't for another 18 hours so I had a long time to wait in this small Swiss airport. After a few hours of trying to sleep, and failing, I noticed that almost everyone had cleared out of the airport and that every shop was closed. The only person left was one seemingly homeless woman who was across the room from me. After some time went by she eventually came up to me to ask me for the time and soon enough we started talking to each other more. Then shit starts to really get weird. She starts telling me about how she is originally from Sweden but has been exiled because she is a lawyer who was having an affair with a high-level politician in Sweden about 20 years ago. During her affair she claimed to have learned a lot about all these horrible things the Swedish government was doing to people and how they were totally keeping this knowledge hidden from the public. She then tells me that she tried to secretly publish a book to let loose to the public and to show them the truth about Sweden but eventually her lover found out and had the Swedish secrete service capture her and drug her in a hospital for months. They would drug her with some special drug that caused her muscles to deteriorate in an attempt to make sure she could never escape. Meanwhile they told her family some lie about how she had died in a car accident and her body was completely destroyed. While this was happening one of her colleagues who she once dated many years ago while attending university and who was now a fellow politician found out that she was in captive. So one night he arranged for her to escape and she flew out to the US where she tried to get our, him from the US, government to help her. But given how crazy her story seemed and how unlike the Swedish government this all was, no one believed her and she was given no help whatsoever. Fast forward to now, and she had been all around the world seeking help from multiple governments but to no success, all while being simultaneously chased by certain Swedish executives. She eventually began to run out of money and now she is living from airport to airport all alone, slowly dying as she put it. The crazy part to this whole story was how detailed she was. She had exact names of every person within her story. And she was stocked up on all essential foods, fruits, vegetables, grains, etc., and with loaves of bread to keep her body functioning enough so she could make it from airport to airport. The only source of cash was from strangers who were kind enough to believe her story. It was roughly six years ago and I was at a friend's house playing FIFA and having a couple of beers. I was driving so I just had one small bottle. Later into the evening I said I was would drive his GF home as it was sort of on my way. We were driving along the sea road where it's very built up and busy. Out of nowhere a cop appeared and pulled me over. He said he thought he had seen me swaying a bit and wanted to test my alcohol levels. I confessed to him I had had one beer, which is well within the legal levels in the UK but we had to wait nearly an hour for the testing kit to arrive. We joked about football teams we supported and even a gentleman's bet on whether I would be over or under the limit. The whole time we were sitting in their car I noticed a man in a white van staring in. 
I thought nothing of it and wasn't scared because what was the worst that could happen whilst I was in a cop car. After the kid arrived the process was very quick and they let me go. My friend's GF had been picked up whilst we were waiting so I headed home. As soon as I pulled out I noticed that the van was now following me. It was a 15 mile journey back to my house down country roads only a house every now and then. 4-5 to five miles out from house and the van was still behind me. I started to worry that maybe this guy's kid had been killed by a drunk driver or something similar and even though I'd been let go he wanted some sort of vengeance. Lots of irrational thoughts crossed my mind. My house is on the corner of a U road. I turned down my road and he followed again. There was no way I was going to turn into our plot as that was a dead end and no one else was home. I passed our house and followed the road all the way around until I was back on the main road. At this point I was terrified knowing now for sure this man was following me. I called 999 and told them the situation. I told them I was going to bomb it to the nearest city, about 5 miles away, and for them to get a cop to meet me at a garage I knew was just outside the city. They set it all up and told me to stay on the line no matter what. I got onto the main road again and quickly took my speed up over 100. The cop on the end of the phone said he couldn't give me permission to speed but I must do what I need to do to make sure I got to the waiting policeman safe. 5 seconds into driving at high speed the van behind started flashing a blue light and its siren had come on. It was another bloody cop. I pulled over and walked back angrily towards him shouting. They were cracking up inside and so was the cop on the phone. They had heard my distress call on their radio and put two and two together. Turns out the man in the van wasn't following me and at some point the policeman behind had taken his place. He thought my behavior was strange by going down our U road and not stopping at any of the houses. There had been a few robberies recently and thought I was a thief. I showed them my ID and proof that I lived on that road and it just made them laugh even harder. The cop at the end of the phone thanked me for the entertainment but said he better free the line to more pressing matters. Scary at the time. Now just a good story. Three months after the death of my BFF, let's call her Jane, bad car accident, I decided to take a nap. I literally never take naps. I don't like how they make me feel after, and I dreamt that I was at Jane's house, but in my dream my other friend Rachel had moved in there with her kids and husband. In my dream I told them, wouldn't it be creepy if Jane haunted this place? They laughed at me for believing in ghosts. I spent the night there and woke up to someone touching my shoulder. I looked up and it was Jane. She said she couldn't talk, but wanted me to meet her at the train station at 7.30 p.m. the next day. I told my friends, they said it was probably a dream, but took me to the train station anyways. I go to the platform and Jane comes up to me from out of nowhere, and my friends can see her, but she only wanted to talk to me. She told me she was sorry that she wasn't able to say goodbye, that she loves me and wanted me to tell her friends and family the same thing. I was crying and asked if we could hug, she said she wasn't sure if it would work since she's dead, but said I could try and it worked. I woke up from my dream crying. A few months after the dream, my friend Rachel really did move into Jane's old house. That's not the end of it. The same day my friend Lisa and I were going together to get our social security cards and while in the office there was a little girl running around who we both thought was the spitting image of Jane when she was little. She was very friendly and would talk to us. We asked her her name and we just about shit when she told us it was Jane. After that we went to a Rite Aid to get pictures developed and the lady working there had the same ring Jane did, but Jane's ring was made for her from her grandfather and was completely original, or so she thought. Still, not over. Months after the first dream I was living back home and one night I had a dream that I was at Rachel's house, her parents' house, late at night and there were a few of us, Rachel, her husband, Lisa, David, and one more that I can't remember. We decided to drive around. It was late at night and Rachel lived in the middle of nowhere deep in the woods. As we were driving someone quickly ran across the street and out of view. We were terrified, but had to know WTH was going on, so I turned the car to where they ran so we could see with the headlights. Sitting on a large rock was Jane, as if this was normal. I get out of the car and say to her, what are you doing? She asked, what do you mean? I replied, you're dead. She says oh. And disappeared. End of dream. It was creepy, but the really creepy part hasn't happened yet. Later that night my friend Lisa calls me to chat. I tell her that has had a dream about Jane and it turns out that Lisa also had a dream. I tell her mine first and halfway through she starts screaming which caused me to stop talking, then she proceeds to tell me my dream, in full detail, but from her point of view in the passenger's seat. We had the same dream on the same night, and in our respective roles. We lived 4 hours away from each other at the time. It took me many years to get enough courage to tell Jane's mom and dad about what Jane told me in my dream but I did after years ago. She cried, but was glad that in a way, Jane was able to say goodbye. 
I'm not sure about ghosts and all that stuff, and I'm not religious, but I don't know how to explain it. I was in Thailand about four years ago having a smoke with a friend out back of a shady bar we were renting a room above. While chatting, a Thai guy asks for a smoke. He looked quite hard up, even by Thai standards, and I don't smoke back home so I gave him most of a pack. I guess he felt like he owed us something so he starts warning us about how Thai people will rip us off and to be careful. The story soon progressed to police corruption including planning drugs on people to get arrests, at this point he pulls out a sizable bag of weed and insists it's not his and the police planted it on him. Even more bizarrely he then tossed the entire bag down the alley. A few cigarettes and a bunch of weirdly rhythmic and very broken English stories later we find ourselves trying to figure out if he really did just tell us he got out of prison today for shooting a cop. After questioning him a little longer we realize he is definitely telling us this and we are awkwardly trying to find a way to excuse ourselves as he explains how to get away with murder in Thailand. It basically involves getting someone drunk then when you are out of booze telling them you have more at home, then you lead them down a dark alley where no one can see and you do the deed there, eventually we manage to tell the guy people inside are waiting for us and we need to go. His response to this is he lives not far from here and we should go have a drink with him. Obviously at this point we quickly and as politely as possible say goodbye and head back in. The next morning the owner of the place tells us to be careful out back as last night not far from the very alley we were smoking in the body of a young Thai guy was found in a side alley. Around two years ago, I was coming back home from the city on a train since I don't drive, and this cracky looking older man kept looking at me from across the car, which was empty beside us and two other people. Being socially anxious, I naturally avoided eye contact and shrunk down behind the oddly high country train seat backs. A few moments later, he got up, came over and sat in the row in front of me. Now, I always sit in that little alcove seat at the end of the row, right in the corner, and he's flipped the seat so that it was facing me, and sat on the L side so there wasn't any way I could slip out or anything. Anyway, so this guy, very visibly drunk, starts trying to talk to me, asking me questions and saying how pretty I was, and continuous tried to get me to go out drinking with him. I politely told him that I don't drink, at this point I was shrinking even further into the corner, and opened up my 3DS to try and ignore him. He then pulled out a bottle of whiskey or something, I don't really remember what it was, I obviously wasn't paying attention to the type of alcohol, and begins shoving a shot of the stuff at my face. He was leaning over me by then, and luckily one of the other men in the car had noticed what was going on and tugged him away from me. The next stop was only a couple of minutes away and when it came, I quickly thanked the man who helped, then skittered off the train as fast as I could. It wasn't my stop, and it was night, so I called a friend to drive me home. That wasn't the end of it, however. A few weeks later, as I was walking home from the store at around 5pm-ish, and this white car drives past me. I didn't think much of it until it looped around the block and passed me again, and then a third time. It was still fairly light out, though the sun was setting at that point, but on that third time, I noticed that the guy driving the car was the same guy who'd harassed me on the train weeks prior. If you haven't figured by my earlier comments, I live in the country, and not just that, a very small country town in Australia with nothing but bush and paddocks for quite a while between the store and my house. The good news is, I've lived in this town ever since I was born, so I knew my way around the area practically by heart. So on the fourth loop, after he'd turned the curb, I dashed off into the bush. I think he saw me because he did a U-turn and came back, stopped the car and got out. I ran as fast as I could through the bush until I reached this old abandoned shack that all the local kids played in back in the day. It was a pretty well-known place in the town, but I doubt this man knew of it because he never found me there, that and I don't believe he was local in the first place. You tend to know the majority of the faces who live in a small town when you're raised there. After a few moments, I grabbed my phone, only to remember that the woods aren't exactly the best place to get reception, so I was all alone in that shack, heart beating like a frightened rabbit's, hiding under the couch for the next hour. In the end, I left the shack while there was still a bit of light out, avoided the roads, and made my way back home through the bush. The sight of my side paddock from the road that marked the end of the bushland was the most relieving thing I'd ever seen in my life. I never saw him again after that, but it was so terrifying that I now bring my dogs with me every time I go to the store. The matter didn't do much for my anxiety, either. Many years ago when I was still in about middle school so about 11 or 12 I was home alone from school. My mother was at work and my dad and sister went to a dentist appointment. Nothing really new I have been home alone before on multiple occasions. This time was a bit weird and defiantly scared the shit out of me. I was sighted in the living room minding my own business watching TV and shit not doing my school work. I hear a knock at the door and since I was still a young buck and not at my full astounding height of 5 feet 8 inches like now so I could not use the peephole thing in the door. 
but there is a window right next to our front door that I always use instead. I go ahead and mosey my stupid ass to the window not making anything of it. This was still in the afternoon and I thought maybe it was the Asian guy next door wanting to borrow yard cleaning equipment again. Instead of creeping slowly to peep around like I usually do I just hopped and skipped my way into hell for the next few hours. I get to the kitchen and I look up out of the window and see some creepy as looking dude I have never seen before. A bit puzzle I placed just long enough trying to figure out who this guy was that he turned and saw me. I stopped dead in my tracks and my eyes frozen wider than any Asian has ever had them. I was too scared to move and when I did after this random ass guy smiled and asked if I could let him in. I noped the fuck out of that and ran back into the living room. Didn't hear anything for a little bit took by dumb ass back to the kitchen and saw him sitting down on the bench by the door directly across from the kitchen window. Noped my chubby ass back into the living room turned off the TV and sat quietly thinking maybe he will think I am not home. Sitting there terrified I had forgotten that my house has a fuck ton of windows around it, actually, looking back, why the fuck were there so many windows in every room on every side of the house? The fuck, man? Including a cool sunroom made of, that's right, motherfucking windows. About 5 minutes pass of me not moving or breathing and then I see him looking at me through one of the tall skinny windows in the living room next to the TV. His hands were cupped around his face and pressed against the window staring back at me with his creepy ass smile. Noped my ass back out of there. For whatever reason every goddamn window in the house was opened or some shit and every room I went to I either saw he walked by a window or he peeked in through one. For about and maybe 20 to 30 minutes of me being petrified with fear thinking of all the horrible thing that were gonna happen to me if he got in the house. I thought if I was fast enough I can call my mom or dad but the phone was in the kitchen which had these damned windows all around it still. With some creep outside the house knocking on all the windows, peering in, and asking for me to let me to open the door and ask me something I made an executive order to lock myself in the bathroom. It felt like an eternity before my sister and dad got back from their appointments. I waited in the bathroom, in the dark because I didn't want this guy to know what room I was in and had the door locked. When they got home I hear someone try to get in the bathroom and I am thinking oh shit. I'm a goner. I'm never gonna know what a vagina looks like. Then I hear my dad call me and I open the door slowly. Turned out my sister had some teeth thing done, can't remember if it was fillings or something but her cheeks were all chipmunking. I said nothing to anyone went right to my room and closed that bitch ass window. And to this day, I have a fear of opening windows to find creepy people looking back at me especially at night but that is a story for another day. To that creepy as dude, next time you gotta pay the trolls toll to get into the boys hole. What did we learn today? Always use the peephole thing in the door and keep those blinds closed. I live in Omaha, Nebraska and my girlfriend needed a ride to work since her car was in the shop. She works downtown at 7 AM so we leave early to beat the traffic. I get her there and we're parked across the street from her building enjoying our coffee and a cigarette when a homeless man walks up with a friend of his. They look like two guys from a misfit show that got out 10 years ago. One of them approaches my window and puts his hand on the glass, his fingers curling inside of the cracked window and his weary eyes shifting between us. This your car? He asked. Yeah. I replied. He smiled and talked with friendliness in his voice like he'd known me a long time. I have an idea, you should give me and my brother a ride. I informed him I had to take my girlfriend to work and I'll never forget this part. Why don't you let her get out and go to work in you and I go for a ride? At this point my hand is on the door handle, ready to slam the door into him and drive away, but instead I just say, sorry, can't help. He stepped away from the car with his eyebrows raised like he was impressed. Then walked away. My girlfriend was pretty shaken up after that. She said his brother just stared at her the entire time. Okay so this story took place in one of the larger cities in Sweden, I'm Swedish so please respect that my English is not perfect, at this time I was living with my dad, his wife and my two little half-sisters in an apartment while I was studying. My school often started around 10 so I was naturally asleep for as long as possible. But my sisters, dad and his wife was up around 7 every day to go to work in kindergarten. I usually woke up when my sister woke up because they were always so loud and screaming about clothes they didn't want to wear or that there was something wrong with the breakfast, you know how little kids are, I used to lay in bed listen to this whole procedure and then go back to sleep when they left the apartment. This morning was the same but at the same time so different. I woke up to my sister's footsteps outside my door and I could hear my dad in the kitchen prepping the breakfast. I knew that I couldn't go back to sleep before they left. So I started my morning routine on my phone by checking all the social media and news. I could hear my youngest sister crying over something I tried to fall asleep again but it didn't work so I decided to go up to have a drink. In Sweden it is very dark outside this early especially in the winter. But as soon as I open the door leading out of my bedroom the noises suddenly stops, 
I could not longer hear my sister crying nor my dad. I realized that the whole apartment is dark and quiet. I felt uncomfortable and went back to my room to check the time on my phone, 3 at night. But I was so sure that I had heard them just a minute before. I didn't sleep more that night just sat on my bed with my eyes on the door waiting for my real sisters to wake up. My grandfather had passed away from stomach cancer when I was very young, 2 or 3 if I remember right. I had spent a lot of time with my grandpa, I did everything with him, I was his favorite. Sad thing is I don't remember a single bit of it because I was too young to remember. Well fast forward to about a week after he passed, my mother was in the living room watching TV and I was in my room playing. My mother then started hearing me in my room sounding like I was carrying on a conversation with someone agreeing with them and such. Really freaked out she called me to come to her, I sit beside her and she asked who I was I talking to in my room? I said papa and she said her heart sunk. She said she thought someone broke into our house posing to be my grandfather. She told me to stay there and she got up with a knife walking around the house but she found nothing. When she came back she asked me what did Papa say. I told her he said everything was going to be alright and not to worry. That broke my mother down and she cried. She claims that this really did happen and I take her word for it to this day. My mom did always point out how if it was truly my grandpa in some shape or form that I was the one he came to since we were so close and I was his favorite. I was hanging out with a friend while he was at college. He had two friends. I knew them for a while and they asked if I could give them a ride to a friend's house to pick up some smoke. I said okay. Went to the house. The guy they were meeting was a person that I had some interest in. They told me to stay in the car, but I told them I would like to talk to him. It all went well. Got back into the car to take them back to the campus. On the way back they started saying that they were part of some secret group with surveillance worldwide. I thought okay, just either delusional or trying to impress me in some weird way. They decided to stop at the mall and get some throwing stars, a new dagger and whatnot. Not at all weird cause I have a nice dagger collection myself. Well we got back to the campus and I walked with them cause they were going to try out the throwing stars and asked if I would like to try. Of course I did, well as soon as we get to the wooded area they started telling me that because I got out of the car that their supervisors now were pissed at them and that they had to appease them. And how they were to do it was to cut off my thumbs. Yes, my thumbs. I said okay and slowly walked backwards backwards, backwards until there was enough space between us. Turned around and high-tailed it out of there. Weird shit man. When I was little my mom woke me up for school and I guess I was still in my dream state and I saw her holding her own head, talking to me. I remember freaking out, but the last thing I remember is waking up again. For a while I thought it was just a weird dream, but when I mentioned it to my mom she told me she remembers that she tried to get me up for school and when I looked at her I had a look of intense fear and I screamed and cried. Something similar happened to my brother when he woke up and found someone watching him. Not the creepiest thing on here, but my mom said she had never seen me so terrified before or since then and pieces of the memory have stuck with me. Another time years later I was in college waiting outside to be picked up when something in the sky caught my eye. It looked grey or silver and I could see it moving very slowly across the sky. I thought it was a plane really high up and I was bored so I watched it for a while moving across the blue background. After a couple minutes I noticed what I thought was my mom's van in the bottom corner of my eye and I glance over. I look back where the object should have been and it was gone, nowhere in sight. It was just there seconds ago and it was moving so slow I should have found it easily, and there was barely any clouds that day. It was then that I realized it wasn't leaving any of those airplane cloud tail things and that it didn't look like any plane I knew of. I still have no idea what it was but it left me feeling very uneasy the rest of the day. I felt like I saw something I shouldn't have seen. A few months back I was in Chicago visiting a friend who just had her first baby I live about an hour out of the city. I was visiting mostly to give her a break to shower and sleep and do human things new mothers don't get to do much. It was a warm fall day, so I loaded the little guy into his stroller and he and I went on a walk. BTW, she lives in uptown, in a condo complex on a pretty nice street. So little dude and I are jamming along for a while when, in my peripheral, I notice a car creeping along next to me on the street. It was something like a rusty old white sedan from the 80s think 82 Ford Fairmont. I glance at it, and continue walking. I'm not too freaked out it's broad daylight and maybe they're just looking for an address on the apartment behind me. But after I glance at it, the car speeds up and passes me, and I breathe a small sigh of relief. Three minutes later, the same thing happens again. I straight up look over at the car and I can see the driver is male, and peering right at me smiling creepily. I decide to give him the hardest bitch face I can summon from deep within my mighty bitch reservoir. Bitch steal. He speeds up and passes me again, and as I'm congratulating myself, the car turns left at the end of the block, 5 to 10 yards ahead, 
and immediately stops dead in the path of where I will be crossing the street, blocking our way. No one is around for at least a block, and I left my phone at the condo. Crap. The window rolls down and a man who I can only describe as a beat-looking Saddam Hussein smiles knowingly at me, lifts his hand, crooks his finger at me, and beckons. The whole effect was creepy as hell, remember I've got an infant in a stroller. I think what the hell can he want with us? And get my key between my knuckles ready for stabbing eyes out. I'm running Travis Bickle-esque lines in my head trying to think of something that will scare him, my heart is pounding, and my mama bear instincts are in high gear. I almost sped up coming at him, I was so ready. Just as I was about to start shouting, he slowly pulled down the street, still smiling out the window at me like we had a secret together, until his face was out of sight. As I crossed, his car paused again, waited for about 10 seconds, then kept going. I speed walked, ducked with the stroller into an alley, waited a minute, and then hauled ass home. And that was it. So my question is, why would a pervert target a woman with a stroller? Thoughts? I'm deeply skeptical about paranormal activity. I don't believe in ghosts. But I still don't know what I saw. About three years ago, I moved with my wife and two kids from the city to our current house in the Burbs. The previous occupants, a husband and wife with two kids, had lived here since it was built in the 80s. According to our neighbors, they were a totally normal and well-liked family. They had recently done some work on the house, the basement was in the middle of being finished. They were planning to stay here for many more years. But then the mom was diagnosed with cancer, and the dad took off. Boom, gone, turned his back on the family just like that. Nobody in the neighborhood has any clue why. The mom passed away pretty quickly after the diagnosis, and a family friend managed the sale of the house, which explains why the process of buying it was a little strange. Not long after we moved in, I was lying in bed, about to close my eyes, when I noticed what appeared to be a silver balloon floating around by the bathroom door. I stared at it, trying to remember whether there were any balloons in the house. As I watched, it wandered around in the air in a really purposeful way, not how a balloon would normally meander. It seemed to me like it was searching for something. I sat up, blinked, and it was gone. I looked around the house, no balloons. I don't know what it was, and it's never happened again. There's probably some explanation, I guess. When my brother was 13 he was part of a juggling club. It consisted of middle schoolers who would perform different juggling tricks for their school. Anyways, a juggling competition was being held in Tracy, California which is essentially in the middle of nowhere. My grandma and grandpa had agreed to take my brother to the competition and my friend Lisa and I decided to tag along. The competition was at a large fair ground, and Lisa and I, both 11-year-old girls, wandered around on our own enjoying our independence. There was a couple small rides on the fair grounds that had been set up for kids. One of the rides was like the teacup ride at Disneyland. We had a couple of dollars and we decided to go for a spin. It was fun, especially because the elderly gentleman who controlled the ride kept letting us ride over and over again free of charge, telling us how beautiful we were the whole time. We didn't pay too much attention to him and we thought it was awesome he was letting us ride free of charge. Side note, at this point it was later in the evening and people from the competition had began to leave. There was no one else near the kitty rides besides the elderly man, Lisa, myself, and a tall, handsome young guy, 20 to 30, who came out of the nearby trailer. He knew the old man and joined in on complimenting Lisa and I on our good looks. The younger guy asked if we wanted to go to his trailer where he had some gifts for us. Boy, we thought we were so lucky. He was so cute, and we couldn't believe this older cool guy was into us. So the four of us make our way over to the trailer. Just as Lisa and I are about to enter the trailer I hear my grandpa yell angrily, Barnaby Jones, get over here now. Lisa and I are so embarrassed grandpa ruined the moment. But grandpa wasn't having it and he dragged out asses to the car. At the time I didn't understand the danger we were in. I look back on it now and I'm so grateful grandpa was there to save the day. This happened not too long ago, sometime late last year. I live in a smallish town in Australia, and my house is about a half hour walk from the high school. At the time, me and my mate were 16 I'm 17 now, and the first half of our journey home after school was along the same road until he turned off towards his house. Now, it was as close to rush hour as it gets with this few people around but the road we were walking along was fairly empty. We were walking on the strip of grass and trees between the service road and the actual road itself when I heard a car pull into the service road behind us. I didn't think much of it at the time as there were a few houses along the street. Before long a white tradies van with a ladder and construction equipment on the roof pulled up next to us and wound their window down. My friend and I stopped because the driver was talking to us with a thick as can be Irish accent. 
My friend is terrible at understanding accents but I kinda have a knack for it. This bloke in the van was wearing a green floral work vest and a cheap cap, and there was someone beside him in the passenger seat who I couldn't make out other than their orange work jumper. The driver asked in his stereotypical accent, you fellas know where the bottle shop is? My friend instantly replies with a dull what? I tell these seemingly innocent tradies that it was back the was they came and around the corner from Woolies. I keep walking in motion for my friend to follow me when these buggers roll the van next to us, call out oi fellas hop in the back and show us the way. My friend repeats what I said about the directions to the bottle shop but these bloody tosspots kept following us for the best part of a block which is fairly big in our town. Eventually we get to where my friend and I part ways and of course, mates being mates, we can talk without words, and through a manly series of nods and grunts and gestures we decide to go the long way and lose these silly galas. So after cutting the paddocks and bushland for the better part of half an hour I get home without further incident. The next day these idiots came up to me again I was alone this time, so, I channeled my inner bogan and let loose with the most foul, profane and creative tirade of insult and threats you have ever heard. They drove off and I never heard from them again. This one night when I was probably nine or so, I woke up in the middle of the night, not sure why. I could hear agonized screams and crying from somewhere in the house, a female's voice, screaming let me live, please God, let me live. I was curious, so I opened the door to investigate, but my father was already there. He didn't say a word, just brought a finger to his lips and shook his head. He closed the door, and shortly after that, the screaming subsided into sobbing and heavy breathing. I heard footsteps from the hall that walked past my room, but it sounded like a large number of people, maybe 10 or so, but far more people than are in my family, for sure. When I checked out my window, not sure why I did, I remember seeing a pale white old-fashioned car, kind of like a Bugatti Royale, in our driveway. I was pretty freaked out, so I couldn't go back to sleep very well, and decided I would read Harry Potter until I felt tired enough. Sure enough, I did fall asleep, but the most unsettling part is that when I woke up, the book was still beside me, and nobody in my family discussed the happenings that night again. A couple of years ago my family took a 14-ish hour trip to a vacation spot up the west coast. We left at around 4 am, at 5 30 ish my dad decides he has to pee so he stops at a rest stop and we were all sleeping or whatever in the back. He comes come and he's arguing with this woman. She was trying to get in the truck Dodge 2500, big pickup, and he was trying to get in without letting her in. He has to shove her and push her away and she's being violent. This chick was on some serious drugs. He gets in the truck and she climbs up into the bed from the wheel, climbs over the top, and gets on the hood. At this point we realize she was not wearing pants or underwear. She squatted down to stare at us and a tampon string is hanging out of her. My 9-year-old brother, 17-year-old me and my parents were all like WTF. My dad dials the police, turns on the truck and reverses sharply and she falls back over the front, gets up, grabs the door handle and tries to hang on as my dad drives away. She was dragged a bit, let's go, and runs away to do the same thing to another car. The police had already been called by someone else the woman approached and were on the other side of the rest stop. My dad went the wrong way down a one-way section to tell the sheriff where the woman was. They go to try to arrest her, and she obviously doesn't cooperate. They tased her and she still was fighting with them until an ambulance picked her up. My dad told the story to the cop and they called us a few hours later to ask if he would be willing to share the story in court if necessary. He said yes, even though it was probably 100 miles away, but that they never called him to do that. Say no to drugs. Two years ago I worked during the summer in children's summer camp. And once we prepared for them this activity, a night game we called it. The hotel that we stayed at had a great portion of woods to it, like there ran a fence around its premises where there was a small forest as well. So we thought that as it is quite safe and they can't wander too far, we will send them into the forest with marked trail and they will have papers to note all the objects that we will place around the trail and the more objects they will find the more points they will get. And also as we thought that we will be funny, the objects we were placing there were meant to be somewhat scary like bedsheets in form of a ghost etc and the kids knew that they are supposed to be looking scary stuff. The game went without any problems, every kid came safely back and on time, so we were really happy that nothing happened and in a good mood we collected their papers and sent them to beds. Shortly we went to mark them and we noticed that object hangman kept appearing again and again. Firstly we thought that someone from our group was probably way too active, placed there some object and didn't tell us but no one confessed to it. So scared shitless we went to check the trail that kids walked that night and guess what? Of course we found a goddamned real hang guy just blowing there in the wind, hanging from branches. We called cops and they identified him as one of the hotel staff. I don't know how, 
but we managed to cover the whole thing up and none of the kids and their parents knew about this. They all thought it was just some decoy. Some of the little fellows that considered themselves badasses told me next morning how they were poking and swinging that wax figure we placed on the tree. As a kid, I lived in a house that was possessed by demons, I joke you not. Pack a lunch, this story is kind of long, but worth it. I promise. So we lived in this house in Brisbane, Australia when I was aged 3 until just before I turned 5. I'll try and cut a long story short, it was a single story home at the front, which went into a two story house at the back. The bottom floor of the house down the back was a huge L-shaped concrete rompus room with a laundry inside the L located directly under the stairs. My little sister was one at the time, and her nursery was on the top level of the house down the back, with my parents' master bedroom next to it. My room was located down the front of the house in the single story. This would have taken place in 1982 to 1983. Anyway, my dad was a journalist and was often working the night deadlines, meaning my mum would be at home by herself quite often. We just moved in, and right from the start my mum said the house felt off. She'd often be sitting alone at night in the front of the house watching TV, and she said she started hearing shuffling noises coming from the back of the house. Thinking I might be awake, she'd come and check on me only to find me fast asleep. She's go and check on my baby sister, and said that every time she'd get to the stairs at the back of the house, the hair on the back of her neck would rise, and she said she had the uncanny feeling that someone was watching her as she was climbing the stairs. The light on the stairs landing would also constantly blow, although mom put this down to bad wiring or similar. The noises escalated from shuffling to hearing people laughing to finally she reported someone calling out her name late at night. She'd come and check, and of course there'd be nothing there. Around this time, mom said I'd wake up screaming every few nights, and that I claimed that there was a man sitting on my cupboard watching me sleep. Of course she put this down to me being a scared toddler. Mum told my dad about what was going on, and of course he didn't believe her. One night, my dad and uncle were taking time after work to paint the interior of my grandmother's house, and so my aunt had come around our house to keep my mum company, bringing my baby cousin along with her. My cousin was teething at the time, and my aunt forgot to bring her mouth cream with her, so my mum agreed to drive down the pharmacy and get some more, as we were also out. Mum sheepishly told my aunt to keep an ear out for weird noises, and told her she thought the house was rather sus. My aunt laughed it off and claimed that she had been in supposedly haunted houses before, and as a spiritual person, lol, she would have felt if there was anything amiss when she walked in. Mum shrugged it off, and drove off, telling my aunt she'd be back in 20 to 30 minutes my mum pulls the car into the driveway at home sometime later to find my uncle's car parked out front. Fearing the worst, she walked in the front door to find my aunt sobbing inconsolably my uncle trying to clam her down while my dad is unhelpfully poking fun at her. Mum turns to my aunt and asks, you heard something didn't you? My aunt said something along the lines of, a few minutes after you left, I heard laughing coming from the back of the house, when I went down to check, I heard something call my name. This house is f% at hashtag ed. My dad shut his mouth about a second later, silenced by a glare from my mum. Anyway, we had a dog, and it would flat out refuse to enter the rumpus room. Its tail would drop and she would whine if mum tried to call her inside. Even in bad weather, she refused to come into the house. About this time, my mum asked the neighbors as to who had been living in the house before us. The neighbor informed us that the lady who lived there before us had suffered a nasty divorce, with her husband walking out on her. She turned to drugs soon after, and got involved in a weird religion which as the neighbor went on to describe, involved people in weird robes coming around the house every month or so. They also reported that they would see weird candlelight coming from rooms in the house during these meetings and that the lady had confided in them that she was conducting seances slash Ouija board sessions in the house. When mum asked where in the house these were conducted, the neighbor stated that it was usually in the rompus room, gauging in where the candlelight could be seen. So not chancing it, mum and dad finally decided to move out. About two weeks out from the removal, mum, now seven to eight months pregnant with my brother, was getting dressed in her room. As I was down the front of the house watching TV, and my sister was asleep in her crib, mum pulled the slide door to her room shut so I wouldn't walk in on her naked. As she's getting dressed in the mirror, she hears the door latch from the other side. Trapped in her room, she started banging at the door and calling for me to stop playing games and let her out. She ended up shimmying down the drainpipe on the side of the house, and ran back up the stairs to her room to find the door wide open. Furious, she came down the front of the house and chided me for locking her in. She said I denied even going upstairs. We were going to church at the time and mum, exasperated now, asked the pastor what we should do to protect ourselves until we moved out. The pastor suggested playing Christian hymns in the house during the day when I was at preschool etc. to see if it would repel whatever was in the house. 
Mom borrowed a record off him of traditional hymns and played them. The day she started playing them, she turned the music up and went outside to hang out the washing. Suddenly she hears banging and crashing coming from the house. She runs inside to find the stairs landing light bulb in pieces on the carpet, and the kitchen cupboard doors all wide open, broken plates and bowls shattered all over the floor. Dad came home to find Mom nearly out of her mind and pleaded with him to move out that night. Dad somehow talked her down, noting that we were leaving in two days' time anyway, and that spending money on a hotel was stupid. Yeah, he was pretty stubborn. The final worst was to come though, on the day before we were due to move out, my mom went to check on my sister in her crib. Now bear in mind my sister is a very small toddler at this point, and has only just started barely walking. Mom walks into the nursery to find my sister isn't in her crib. Horrifyingly, her window, which is a huge horizontally sliding window with a lock, is wide open, and the fly screen has been punched through. My mom looks out the window to see my sister crawling around, as happy as Larry, two stories below. Mum sets a world land speed record down to the backyard and asks my sister what had happened. My sister simply looks up and says, Mummy. Doggy down down. My mum was a nurse, and checked my sister over for injuries. Miraculously, she was fine, and looking under the window, the awning over the back door, below my sister's window, had a huge dent over it, meaning it had broken my sister's fall out of the window. There is no possible way my sister could have crawled out that window without help, let alone open a huge heavy window and punch through a fly screen. My mum didn't even pack her stuff, she grabbed the three of us and we moved to my grandmother's that night. My dad had to complete the removal the next day by himself.